Hey guys Universal here. Harry Potter isn't really something I see other what if YouTubers posting. Hence why I am uploading a Harry Potter fanfic. Without further ado. Enjoy. Chapter 1. Dumbledore you can't. I've been watching them all day. You couldn't find two people who are less like us. And they've got this son I saw him kicking his mother all the way up the street, screaming for sweets. Harry Potter come and live here. It's the best place for him, said Dumbledore firmly. His aunt and uncle will be able to explain everything to him when he's older. I've written them a letter. A letter, repeated Professor McGonagall faintly, sitting back down on the wall. Really, Dumbledore, you think you can explain all this in a letter? These people will never understand him. He'll be famous a legend I wouldn't be surprised if today was known as Harry Potter Day in the future there will be books written about Harry every child in our world will know his name. Exactly, said Dumbledore, looking very seriously over the top of his half-moon glasses. It would be enough to turn any boy's head. Famous before he can walk and talk. Famous for something he won't even remember. Can't you see how much better off he'll be? growing up away from all that until he's ready to take it. Professor McGonagall opened her mouth, changed her mind, swallowed, and then said, Yes yes, you're right, of course. After taking the child from Hagrid's massive arms, Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall bent forward over the bundle of blankets. Inside, just visible, was a baby boy, fast asleep. Under a tuft of jet black hair over his forehead they could see a curiously shaped cut, like a bolt of lightning. Is that where, whispered Professor McGonagall. Yes, said Dumbledore. He'll have that scar forever. Couldn't you do something about it, Dumbledore? Even if I could, I wouldn't. Scars can come in handy. I have one myself above my left knee that is a perfect map of the London Underground. And with that... A young child's fate was sealed, or was it? Oh. Petunia enjoyed this time of day the most, early in the morning before her two strapping boys had risen from their beds. This was her chance to read the gossip columns in the daily paper while peacefully enjoying her first cup of tea. Only after this much-loved ritual would she start making the large breakfast her menfolk required. This was her normal way to start the day and Petunia hated anything that interfered with her oh-so-normal life. Discovering a baby on your doorstep when you went to fetch the morning paper was certainly not something that could be considered normal. That the baby had his tiny fist clutching a letter addressed to Petunia Disley immediately ruled out any chance of mistaken identity, the child had been deliberately left at number 4 Privet Drive's doorstep. The chill that saw Petunia draw the quilted housecoat tighter around her thin body wasn't purely down to this year's first touch of frost on their front lawn. That a baby could survive out here, never mind be ignored by both the milkman and the paperboy, reeked of something she was desperately trying to forget even existed. The reports on the news of owls behaving strangely and weird light shows in the sky began to make some sense to the housewife. Only something cataclysmic in the magical word would see this child end up here. Lily's eyes staring at her from this child left no room for doubt to his identity. Petunia was reluctant to take the Potter child into her home but what choice did she have? If she left him there then the neighbors were bound to notice eventually, that couldn't be allowed to happen. Vernon was awoken by his clearly upset wife, that he couldn't smell his bacon cooking provided a further clue to just how upset she was. Seeing the letter clutched in her hand had Vernon sitting up in bed and reaching for his reading glasses. After reading the words on the strange paper, Vernon blew his top. Who do these bastards think they are, that they can dump their unwanted rubbish on our doorstep and expect us to look after their mess? I'm sorry to hear about your sister Petunia but we will not be raising her son. We'll just give him back and explain we don't want the little freak. It was a very nervous Petunia who answered her enraged husband. The letter said that the boy living here would provide some kind of protection for our family, for Dudley, shouldn't we? Her husband cut right across her. That's a load of tosh, designed to get us to take the boy in. If our family is in danger then we call the police, I would rather put my faith in them than some crackpot who leaves babies on doorsteps in November. But Vernon, where would we give him back to? An orphanage. 
The boy will be better amongst his own kind, didn't you say once that they had their own government? Yes, but I wouldn't have a clue where to find it. I visited a place called Diagon Alley once when Lily had just turned eleven, I never went back there again. That will have to do then. I'll go there and hand the sprog over to the first respectable person I see. Put this letter back in the envelope and they can have that as well. I'll want my breakfast first though. Petunia recognized an order when she heard one and rushed downstairs to the kitchen. As she was cooking breakfast, it gave her time to reflect on the wider implications that the Potter child currently in her living room signified, Lily was dead. She attempted to rationalize why that news didn't hurt her more and could really only come up with one answer. As far as Petunia was concerned, the girl she knew as Lily Evans started the process of being dead to her from the first year the redhead left on that train to Scotland. Lily finally completed that journey the day she angrily proclaimed Vernon Disley wasn't good enough for Petunia Evans. Petunia drew no comfort from the thought that Lily's own marriage had apparently been a direct contributor to her death at the age of only 21. Oh. Vernon was in a foul mood. He'd walked up and down Charing Cross Road at least a dozen times and all he had to show for it was sore feet. That wasn't exactly true, his left arm was numb from the weight of the child he had resting there. Vernon had seen plenty of what he would consider freakish people walking up and down too, but they all seemed to disappear the instant he took his eyes of them. He had resorted to staring but something always seemed to catch his attention just before they disappeared. The child was starting to gurn again but Vernon had the Disley patented answer for that, his mother swore by it and it had worked on his own son. One of Dudley's old dummy tits dipped into a tiny pot of honey soon quietened the child, the boy liked it so much his little hand closed over Vernon's meaty finger. For Vernon, this was like the curtains being drawn back. Suddenly he could see the decrepit old pub sitting there exactly as his wife described it. He had never seen an establishment that was less inviting in his life but it held the means for him to dispose of the bundle currently clinging to his finger, he kept his head down while entering the leaky cauldron. Petunia had told him he needed to go through to the back of the pub where a wall would grant him access, though he would need to wait on someone opening it before he could enter the alley. Their fears of Vernon standing out as being normal were proving totally groundless, he could have rode in there upon an elephant and no one would have batted an eyelid. The whole place appeared to be in the midst of some kind of celebration, a celebration that seemed to have been ongoing for at least a day or two. He had no trouble following a young family through the back of the pub to reach his destination, Vernon then found himself standing in what he considered to be the capital city of Freakish. This brought even more problems though, he'd promised Petunia he would leave the child with someone respectable. Try as he might, Vernon just couldn't see anyone who matched his description of that word. He had just about settled on an ice cream shop when Vernon spotted the large, white marble building. Discovering that this was a bank cemented his decision, he boldly walked up the wide stairs to an establishment that screamed respectability at him. The shock that awaited him inside the marble building almost had the disgusted Vernon running back out, a closer look saw him change his mind. Yes these creatures were undoubtedly not human, but this establishment was also undoubtedly recognizable as a bank. There were tellers working with orderly queues waiting to be served, that the people in these queues were clearly freaks was only to be expected. What clinched it for Vernon was that these creatures at least knew how to dress properly. All wore three-piece pinstripe suits, with bow ties or cravats, none of these robe things that their customers seemed so fond of. He could ignore the large teeth and pointed ears, anyone wearing a suit couldn't be all bad. Vernon himself was of course dressed in a suit so girded his loins and joined what he considered the shortest queue. When it was finally his turn to be dealt with, the surly little creature didn't even look up while displaying a shocking lack of customer relations skills. What do you want? Vernon thought this would be easy, he was accustomed to using his imposing size to bully those smaller than himself which was just about everybody. Deciding to get straight to the point, he also let loose with his razor-sharp wit. This was a double whammy that should ensure he obtained the outcome he wanted here. I want to make a deposit. With that, he dumped the boy and letter on the teller's counter. 
A smiling Vernon didn't notice the two goblin guards with razor-sharp axes take up position behind him, only the teller's raised hand stopping them taking further action. The names of Potter and Dumbledore on the letter meant this needed to be passed up to a higher authority, this was way beyond what any goblin at a teller counter was cleared for. The little creature flipped up a, position closed, sign before jumping down from his high stool and waddling away with the letter clutched in its long fingers, leaving Vernon with no other choice but to grab the child and follow on behind. Bark Hoke was busying himself with tying down the Potter accounts and properties. Since wizards had decreed his clients' wills would not be read, he intended to ensure that any who tried would be denied access to all Potter property. He was currently debating with himself what to do about the trust fund James and Lily had set up for their son when a knock at the door had him calling enter. He was reading the note held in his hands while studying the sorry human sitting across from him, Bark Hoke was impressed by neither of them. This obese human walrus had dumped the last scion of the House of Potter onto his desk as if it was a pile of dirty laundry. The goblin parted the blanket Harry was wrapped in to study the child. Its little hand shot out and immediately wrapped around his finger while golden eyes stared into the green eyes Harry had clearly inherited from his mother. The goblin also couldn't miss the scar on the child's forehead. Can I ask why you brought this child here? Vernon appreciated the opulence of the office he'd been led into, this was no mere teller. He also decided to be perfectly honest with this creature. I didn't know where else to take him. It was this or an orphanage, but I felt it would be better if he was raised amongst his own kind. I have no idea how to arrange that, which is why I brought him into your bank. The goblin couldn't mistake the emphasis this human had placed on the phrase his own kind, Bark Hook had been hearing this phrase from wizards his entire life. Teller Grip Hook also told him the large pile of garbage was as conceited and arrogant as any pure blood he'd ever met, that information had not been passed on in English. Goblins had been putting up with that rhetoric for generations because nothing was more important to them than treasure and the so-called guardian of Harry Potter had just placed untold treasure on his desk. Bark Hoke needed more information though before making any decisions here. The wizard who signed this letter is the most powerful figure in British magical society. If Gringotts were to attempt to place Harry Potter with a wizarding family, Dumbledore would remove him and once more take the child to your house. Vernon appeared resigned now, though hardly upset about the matter. Very well. I will just have to take him to an orphanage. I still think he should be raised by his own kind but I won't lose any sleep over the matter. I refuse to have my son exposed to his freakishness, staying at our house is simply not an option I'm prepared to accept. The goblin knew what this statement meant for the protection Dumbledore was attempting to establish at this residence, that the muggle knew nothing of the benefits of these wards was hardly Barcoke's fault. He really had only one more question to ask. Does your wife agree with this decision? Vernon's answer left no room for any doubt. Absolutely 100%. Our main concern will always be our own son, and we won't let anything interfere with that. Bark Hoke sat back with his long fingers steepled in front of him, he appeared the epitome of calm while his mind was racing a mile a minute. He well understood that the radical thoughts running through his head could see a blade part him from it but Bark Hoke was slowly talking himself into a crazy course of action. Even mentioning this action to the director would mean his life could never be the same again, he thought the possible benefits outweighed the very real risks. Mr. Disley, there might be something I can do to help but I would need to speak with the director of the bank first. Can I offer you some refreshments while you wait? As the tea, milk, and sugar appeared on a small table that moments ago wasn't there, Vernon was all set to politely refuse until a tray of fruit scones was suddenly next to it. This was a temptation too far for Vernon who quickly accepted his host's offer. Bark Hoke was mentally rehearsing how he was going to pitch the biggest gamble Gringotts Bank and his race had taken in centuries to the director, knowing Ragnoke would already be in a bad mood since he didn't currently have an appointment. At the moment Bark Hoke thought the odds were at best a coin toss. Tails he would win or his head he would lose. Oh. The Potter accounts manager had sweat running off his forehead by the time he finished the pitch, Ragnoke was too quiet. The expected explosion soon came though. 
You want to throw the goblin nation into a war over a human child? I think you've lost your head and I am ready to give the order that will make that condition permanent. What do you think the ministry would do when they discovered we have the child they're calling the boy who lived in Hailing as their savior? With the greatest of respect sir, I don't believe the ministry will be involved in this at all. Dumbledore blocked the potter while reading and told the Wisengamot the boy was safe, he certainly won't want to publicly admit to everyone he lied. If it were to become known the chief warlock left the potter heir on a muggle doorstep, it might even be a large enough scandal to bring him down. Bark Hoke took the director's silence as permission for him to continue talking. After the happenings over the course of the other night, there can be no doubt the boy really is a child of prophecy. Having Harry Potter raised by goblins would be a coup of epic proportions, and provide us with a golden opportunity to install goblin values in a wizard destined for greatness. We have Dumbledore over a barrel, provided the lad attends Hogwarts at age 11. I would also like our healers to have a look at the dark magic lurking at the sight of his scar. He could see this appealed to the director but his next question showed there was still a ways to go to convince Ragnok this could be good for the goblin nation. Even without the backing of the ministry, Dumbledore could still make a lot of trouble for us. How do you propose to handle the old wizard? This was the crux of the matter. The next few minutes would determine if he left this room with his head still attached to his shoulders. That letter passes responsibility for Harry Potter onto his muggle relatives, Ragnok nodded impatiently so Barkhoke blurted out the next bit. I plan to draw up an escrow agreement, that should take care of all the legal requirements. Barkhoke sweated as the silence drew out, it was broken by the deep belly laughter rolling out of Ragnok. Oh that's too cruel legally cut Dumbledore off at the knees. I approve. Bark Hoke almost sunk to the floor in relief but his training saw him stand proud, the director's next comment really surprised him though. Go and arrange for our young crow, no, let the lad henceforth be known as old crow. Ragnok was laughing now at his own wit, it would be a stupid goblin that didn't laugh along with the director. Go and arrange for old crow to spend the next ten years learning the ways of our people. You understand that I hold you personally responsible for the success of this project. Bark Hoke quickly agreed and thanked the director for this opportunity, before getting out of there as quickly as he could. Ragnok personally naming the child would add a level of protection Bark Hoke couldn't have considered when thinking through this idea, as a wizard being raised as a goblin, Harry would need all the help he could get. Bark Hoke himself had been touched by tragedy when his life mate had died during a complicated and difficult childbirth, that the son she'd died giving birth to barely survived her by 24 hours was a double tragedy. That this son was their first child compounded the misery, like young Harry, Bark Hoke was now the last of his line. Oh there were a few distant cousins still lurking about who hoped to inherit everything once he passed from this world, only if he didn't challenge the greedy cowards to a duel before the end. At least if they defeated him, they could then claim it had been earned. Young Harry Potter had touched something more than just his finger in that office. Here was another much-loved son destined for the scrap heap of life because his mother had died prematurely, well not if Bark Hoke could do something about it. His clan had looked after the House Potter finances for generations, he was just taking those close ties a step further. If things went the way he hoped, Harry Potter would be adopted as his son until the child was old enough to make his own decisions. Oh. Vernon was trying to decide if having a fifth scone could be considered as being greedy when his host re-entered his office. He actually appreciated this creature's no-nonsense approach to business, there was no time wasted on mindless chit-chat about sports or the weather. Mr. Disley, have you ever heard of an escrow agreement? As expected, this question was met with a negative response so the goblin banker explained the concept. As you already know, Gringotts is fundamentally a bank. An escrow agreement is where a sum of money or property is held by a third party until specific conditions laid out in a contract can be met. I propose an agreement between the Disleys and the House of Potter, with the goblins acting as bankers, looking after the property until the predetermined conditions are met. As the Potter account manager, my signature should be acceptable on a business agreement until young Harry comes of age. 
Vernon wasn't sure what was being offered here and wanted to make certain he understood everything before making any decisions. Can the brat be considered property, and what would these conditions be? Bark Hoke was really having to keep his temper in check at this muggle's disrespect to a child. How anyone could treat a toddler with such hate was beyond goblin understanding. In magical law, children and wives are routinely considered property of the wizard, that will cause no problems. As to the conditions, I think we should keep them as simple as possible, less chance of other people being able to attach their own interpretations to the wording then. Vernon was naturally all in favor of keeping things as simple as possible, just as long as he left here without the bundle in his arms. I think it's safe to assume that it's not the child himself you and your wife object to, rather the fact that he's probably a wizard. Vernon agreed with that assessment so Barkhoke gave him the gist of the Disley's part of the agreement. If fate decrees the child is not a wizard, he returns to your family to be raised as your nephew. If, on the other hand, Harry Potter is a wizard, the escrow agreement would see Gringotts responsible for him until the boy becomes of age to represent House Potter. This sounded exactly what he wanted but Vernon was determined to double check everything. So, unless he's normal, my family will never see him again. Bark Hoke gave him the confirmation he needed. That describes exactly what the contract will state, though I must point out it is imperative that your wife also signs the escrow agreement. Since both he and Petunia were certain the brat was a freak, this would work out perfectly for them. That will not be a problem, how long will it take to draw up the papers? The words had no sooner left his mouth before the teller he had first dealt with entered the office with a scroll in his hands. Vernon left Gringotts thinking that normal banks placed far too much emphasis on being polite and caring to their customers, and not enough on taking care of business. As he retraced his steps through the pub he actually pitted the poor goblin bankers, imagine having to serve nothing but freaks all day. Oh. The healers were extremely angry, Bark Hoke fully shared that anger after hearing their diagnoses and prognosis. They were raging that this child had been left untreated. Even worse, it would appear that treatment was deliberately withheld. The longer this condition went untreated, the more severe the trauma would be for removing this disgusting thing from the child. As the healers sent for a pig to act as a new host for this abomination, Bark Hoke knew it was his duty to report this news to the director. The Potter accounts manager could confidently predict there would be no laughter at this meeting. That the Dark One had stooped so low as to use this most foulest form of magic would not only disgust Ragnok, it was practically a foregone conclusion that all the vaults under Gringotts would need to be inspected in case any more of these affronts to nature existed there. It was also not inconceivable that a certain Albus Dumbledore could suddenly find himself suffering from banking difficulties. What was inconceivable to the goblin was that the chief warlock could miss the dark magic radiating from the child's scar, to deliberately ignore this was criminal. For a goblin, committing a crime against a child was as low as you could get. Oh. Albus could no longer ignore the readings, or lack of, coming from the instruments he'd tied to the wards around the Potter boy's residence. He'd been putting this confrontation off but, with the children now safely on the Hogwarts Express to begin their Christmas holidays, the headmaster's last excuse about being too busy had left with them. It was time to once more visit Privet Drive. It was an invisible Dumbledore who took his second stroll along Privet Drive, he wanted to ensure his instruments weren't malfunctioning before disturbing the Disleys. His wand soon confirmed the information his sensors at Hogwarts were telling him, there were no wards whatsoever around this property. Albus decided to do some snooping. Watching through the window as Petunia played on the floor with her large son, all the while the husband sat in an enormous chair and never removed his head from the newspaper, Albus was puzzled why Harry wasn't part of this scene. It would appear the only way he would discover the information he required was by entering the house. He at least had the good manners to ring the doorbell and wait until it was answered. Petunia was stunned when she opened the door, she was just reminding herself that it was nearly Christmas, and not Halloween, when the six-and-a-half-foot gaudy garden gnome spoke. Good evening Mrs. Disley. My name is Albus Dumbledore, could I have a few words with you regarding your nephew, 
Harry Potter. The instant she heard the name Dumbledore, Petunia tried to slam the door in his face. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, the door refused to move from the open position. Harry Potter doesn't live here, and we don't know where he is. This led to a rather loud what, from the wizard. Vernon had started moving the second he heard the name Dumbledore mentioned, he was now thundering down the hall to confront this wizard who caused him so much work. My wife is correct, the freak doesn't live here. Did you honestly think you could just dump the brat on us, without as much as an explanation, and we would accept that? You must be used to dealing with the wrong kind of people, decent, hard-working folk like us would never accept that situation. Albus was seriously struggling to accept the situation he was finding himself in. But, I left you a letter. Vernon always had a quick and fiery temper but this idiot just poured petrol all over it. Do you honestly think that including a letter makes amends for dumping a baby on someone's doorstep? You sir need to go and get yourself a job somewhere as Father Christmas, the kids might accept the crap you hand out but the Disleys never will. Albus had his half-moon glasses in one hand, while the fingers of his other massaged the bridge of his nose. Where is the boy, what have you done with him? Vernon was quite proud of himself for the solution he'd devised, he didn't see the need to tell this freak though. I negotiated a contract, Petunia signed it and then it turned golden before disappearing. I was told this would only happen if it was legal and above board, we'll thankfully never have to see the brat again. As the muggle was reliving that particular morning in his mind, Albus was watching it unfold using a mind probe. He couldn't help but be shocked at what he saw. The goblins have control of Harry Potter, do you realize what you've done? Vernon wasn't about to stand here and have his elegant solution questioned. Hey, you were the one who left him on a doorstep in the middle of the night. I at least put some effort into making sure he was raised by his own kind. Albus was now glad he had charmed the area around the door, the arguments were getting louder and there appeared to be no possibility of him being invited inside. How could you possibly think the goblins were his own kind? Didn't you read the part of the letter that told you Harry living here would offer this family protection? Vernon got even louder, screw the neighbors. Tall or short, you're all just freaks to me. And no, we didn't buy that protection shit you were trying to shovel. This infuriating muggle had just given Albus a massive headache, how to get Harry Potter back. He decided to leave them with something painful to mull over. A young couple with a son, same age as yours, were recently tortured into insanity. They may be technically still alive but that young mother will never hold her child in her arms again. The protection gained by Harry living here would have prevented that ever happening to you. He heard the gasp of terror coming from Petunia and thought the bitch deserved it. How could anyone give away their only nephew? I shall leave now and wish you a Merry Christmas, we can only hope you and your family enjoy many more. Dumbledore popped away, leaving Petunia clinging to her husband's arm. Oh Vernon, perhaps we should have kept the freak? We could have stuck him in the cupboard under the stairs out of the way. Petunia, the old man was deliberately trying to scare us. He's just pissed off because he didn't get his own way. This was little comfort to the worried mother. But Dudley. Listen, let's enjoy Christmas and, if you still feel the same way in the new year, we'll look at moving house. It wouldn't hurt for me to get a shotgun either, soon show these freaks we mean business. Vernon could see the worry literally drop off his wife, Petunia was probably planning how she would decorate their new home. The new house should also have a bigger lounge, this would be the excuse for him to buy that new giant TV he had his eye on. Oh. Albus walked up to the first available teller at Gringotts and asked to see the Potter accounts manager. The goblin in front of him though just added to his already bad day. Do you have an appointment? No I thought. What do you want to see him for? That's personal, needless to say. Albus was interrupted again. Who shall I say wishes to see him? I am Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore, surely you must have heard. Wolfric after Percival but before Brian. Albus could only sigh and nod his head in agreement, only to discover the goblin wasn't even looking at him so he was forced to say yes. Okay, and last name Dumbledore? 
I'll go and see if there is anyone available to deal with your request at the moment. Please remain here. It had been Dumbledore's experience that when the goblins were at their most obstructive, it meant you had upset them in some way. He was struggling to think what he'd done to merit this treatment but reckoned he would soon find out, he didn't have long to wait. Four security guards with drawn weapons surrounded him and demanded he follow their lead. He was surprised but delighted to find himself in the director's office, now at least he was getting somewhere. Or so he thought. Director Ragnok, delighted to see you again. The director cut across him as abruptly as the teller had. Let's cut the dragon shit Dumbledore, I have better things to do than stand here and listen to you talk nonsense. The reason you are in here is to give you this. Albus found a scroll being slapped into his hand. This is a notice of vault closure, you have 24 hours to take your belongings from the Dumbledore vault before we seal it. After that time, Gringotts will no longer do business with you. This was totally unexpected and an extremely serious development, getting kicked out of Gringotts was a sanction used for only the very worst offenders. Perhaps there has been a mistake here. Oh yes, and it was you who made it. We now know that the Dark One is not gone, and we also know how this was achieved. This was information that could have seriously compromised Gringotts, yet you deliberately withheld it from us. Albus suddenly understood what was going on here. Did you find any in the vaults? You must tell me. Ragnok's answer was scathing. Oh, so now you want a spirit of cooperation between us? I must tell you nothing. Get him out of here. Albus was being dragged out before he'd got what he came for. Wait, what about Harry Potter? The director's sneer was predatory. Send his Hogwarts letter to Gringotts, I'll make sure he gets it. Albus was rather unceremoniously herded into the main lobby of Gringotts by the guards, the old wizard then headed back to Hogwarts. He would need to make some quick arrangements on where to store the items from his vault. Albus decided to tell no one about this, being barred from Gringotts was ammunition his enemies didn't need to have. His plan for Harry Potter was to ensure the boy wouldn't be seen again in the British magical community until the child's arrival at Hogwarts. That plan was still viable, though it would be a different Harry Potter who now stepped onto the express. Just how different was something Albus was going to have to wait ten years to discover. Chapter 2 Hermione Granger was different, she'd always known that. It would be hard not to when the children that you attended school with went out of their way to point this fact out to you every single day. Having really bushy hair and rather large front teeth were obvious targets for her main antagonists, being top of every class didn't help the situation any either. Her continual lack of friendship had led Hermione to seek her escape in the printed word, always having a book in her hand though was just more ammunition for the various groups of Hermione haters. She may have heard variations of the terms buck-toothed bushy-haired bookworm hundreds of times, that didn't mean those words didn't hurt on each and every one of those occasions. Then, almost a year ago, an event happened that explained why she was different, Hermione Granger was a witch. While her mum and dad had taken some convincing of this fact, the instant Professor McGonagall had spoken those special words Hermione had known deep within herself this was indeed true. The preceding months had been some of the best of her young life. Schoolyard taunts no longer had the power to her, she was different and would be leaving for a special school where things would be so, so different. Hermione Granger was done with being an outsider, she was going to a place where everyone would be the same as her, a place where she could finally have friends. This had been her shield and armor against the taunts and jibes that had viciously escalated as the bullies attempted to get a reaction from their favorite target. It was perhaps somewhat understandable then that the young witch was near to tears since those dreams were beginning to appear to be mere fantasy, and she wasn't even on the bloody train yet. The day had started so well too, up at the crack of dawn so she could be fully prepared for her new adventure. A breakfast where she never seemed to stop talking was followed by the car ride to King's Cross, bright and early of course. Saying goodbye to her parents at the barrier had been hard, but a new life awaited her and she was quite prepared to run through a brick wall to get there. Hermione did just that, and then things started going downhill. 
On her first sight of platform nine and three quarters, it wasn't the bright red Hogwarts Express that caught the young witch's attention. It was the group of four witches already in their green-trimmed Hogwarts robes that drew Hermione like a moth to a flame. Unfortunately, just like said moth, she got burned. Deciding to introduce herself, Hermione was met with looks of disgust and derision, it wasn't supposed to be this way. Confidence severely dented, she then discovered another problem. Her trunk, loaded of course with extra books, that her dad had easily lifted onto the trolley was proving impossible for Hermione to physically place on the train. As she struggled with the trunk, sniggering laughter almost had her in tears. A kind voice cut through her frustration and mounting despair. Can I help you miss? Hermione raised her head and had trouble believing the person standing there could possibly exist, far less be speaking to her. If Fitzwilliam Darcy and Elizabeth Bennet ever had a son, he was standing right in front of Hermione Granger and offering his assistance. The boy was even dressed as if he'd just stepped out of the pages of Pride and Prejudice, Hermione's favorite book. His black frock coat had silk lapels, it also had to be wide at the shoulders to accommodate the body it clothed. Being fitted to accentuate a slim waist was also an effect that the young witch appreciated. The grey waistcoat just visible under the coat matched his trousers, with button-up black boots being a nice touch. The ascot knotted cravat, with a diamond cravat pin being a fitting finish to this very nice ensemble. His jet black wavy hair hung down to his shoulders and framed what Hermione would consider a kind face, but those wonderfully expressive almond-shaped green eyes melted her heart. If it wouldn't be considered blasphemy, Hermione reckoned this boy was too gorgeous even for Jane Austen to do justice. She must have muttered some kind of answer to his question because he smiled and lifted her trunk clean into the compartment. With that smile, Hermione knew she was gone. Her mother had sat Hermione down for a talk about boys before she headed off to Hogwarts, the young witch had foolishly thought most of it would never apply to her. Hermione had never understood her classmates' devotion to the latest boy bands, who cared what new kids on the block were doing offstage, or on stage for that matter. She had though her first crush would be on some handsome author or, heaven forbid, a teacher. In the space of a few seconds the boy in front of her had just shattered that illusion into a gazillion pieces. She had to say something, he couldn't leave here thinking she was some driveling drooling moronic fangirl, she didn't even know his name. Thank you, that was very kind. You're welcome to share this compartment, if you want. The words were out before Hermione realized what she'd said, she was berating herself for once more providing an opportunity to be hurt when his wide smile surprised the hell out of her. I'd like that, very much. Not believing her luck, she offered her hand for shaking. I'm Hermione Granger. The boy didn't shake her hand. He took it by her fingertips and very gently turned her hand around before bending down and lightly brushing his lips over the back of her knuckles. There was no longer room for any doubt, Hermione Granger was well and truly smitten. Very pleased to meet your acquaintance Miss Granger, my name is Harry Crow. Hermione just started to babble as the words poured from her mouth. Nobody in my family's magic at all, it was ever such a surprise when I got my letter, but I was ever so pleased, of course, I mean, it's the very best school of witchcraft there is, I've heard I've learned all our course books by heart, of course, I just hope it will be enough. The laughter coming from Harry certainly couldn't be classed as sarcastic, it seemed almost friendly in nature. Relax Hermione, and breathe occasionally. We've a long train journey ahead of us, plenty of time to get to know each other and become friends. Hermione couldn't believe what she was hearing. Friends. Oh, sorry if I'm being a bit presumptuous here, my main reason for attending Hogwarts is to hopefully make friends. Me too and I would love to be your friend. Both then sat and began their journey, not only to Hogwarts but the much more important destination of friendship. Oh. Albus paced up and down his office, as jumpy as the proverbial cat on a hot tin roof. Harry Potter had been missing from the wizarding world for almost a decade, today would see his return. The goblins had kept a very close eye on the boy but this evening he would come back into Albus Dumbledore's domain, 
it only remained to see how much damage he would have to undo from the boy's unorthodox upbringing. Albus intended to permanently wrench the boy away from the goblins, and had a scheme in place to achieve this at the first available opportunity. Tonight the boy would learn who the real power in Magical Britain was, and it wasn't any goblin. Oh. As the express sped them away from London, Harry was trying to make sure his new friend wasn't pulling his leg. So your parents are a type of healer, but they only heal inside their patient's mouth. Hermione could hardly contain her laughter at Harry's disbelieving look. Yes, that's what dentists do. I'll make a deal with you, you can ask me anything about muggles if I can do the same with you regarding pure bloods. I'm sorry but I can't do that, I'm not a pure blood Hermione. Oh, I just took it from the way you're dressed that's what pure bloods wore. Harry was looking wary at his new friend, he still wasn't sure whether this was some kind of wind up. I'm supposed to be dressed as a muggle, are you telling me this isn't right? This time Hermione couldn't hold her laughter, that was until she saw Harry's crestfallen appearance. I'm sorry Harry, I thought you were making a joke there. Muggles used to wear clothes like that, but not for the best part of a century. She was desperate for more information but didn't want to push anything, Harry seemed really upset at her revelation. This is great. Instead of blending in with one group of students I'm going to stand out like a sore thumb. The tailors made exact copies of the styles in the Muggle Studies books, how could they be wrong? Hermione had an idea what had gone wrong but needed to make sure. Did they get those books from Diagon Alley? Harry's nod was all the conformation she needed. My mother thought that would at least be one subject she could understand so bought a few of the books, Mum said they were some of the funniest things she'd ever read. All of the information in them is about a century out of date, and even then some of it was wrong. She reckoned that the authors had never actually met someone without magic. Well, that's just great. Director Ragnok named me Old Crow, he would probably have been better calling me Birdie Bot. He saw the questioning look on Hermione's face before remembering she knew a lot less about the magical community than he did, it was time to tell her the story. Bertie Botts is a type of sweet that comes in every flavor, that describes me perfectly. My mom was like you, Muggleborn while my dad was a pure blood. Both gave their lives to save mine when I was just a toddler. I can't remember anything about them and now my adoptive father is a goblin. As I said, the goblin leader named me Old Crow, due to the way I ended up in Gringotts. My father calls me Harry Crow but my mum and dad named their newborn baby Harry James Potter. He couldn't miss the gasp that came from Hermione at that revelation. So, as you can imagine, I have a foot in many camps but don't know which one I belong to. I had hoped to honor my mother's memory by dressing like this today but it looks like that's gone now. Hermione couldn't help herself, without even thinking about her actions, she had moved across the carriage to sit beside Harry and already had him in a hug. Oh Harry, you know I'll help you any way I can. He was as stiff as a board, goblins didn't do hugs. As Hermione offered her assurance of assistance, Harry began to relax and think that the goblins had got at least one thing wrong, this was nice. For some reason he trusted this girl, his first real friend, and began to tell her more than he'd intended to reveal. When my parents were murdered, I was dumped on the doorstep of my mother's muggle sister. They didn't want me so did a deal with Gringotts where the goblins will look after me until I'm old enough to take up the responsibilities of heading House Potter. I have this weird mixed heritage and soon I'll be forced to make a decision, just where does my future lie? Hermione was holding him close and thinking this was something she could get used to. She needed to help her first friend. I read accounts of Harry Potter in a few reference books, all of them speculated on what had happened to you after that Halloween. Looks like none of them were even close. This drew a slight laugh from Harry, and allowed Hermione to release her hug before it became embarrassing. She still continued to sit closely beside him though. You should have seen some of the Harry Potter books they tried to publish as true stories of my life, they would certainly have entertained your mum as much as those history books. My father soon put a stop to it, making it illegal for anyone to make a profit off my name. Hermione was puzzled about a million different things concerning Harry but didn't want to push, 
she hoped he would tell her in his own time. One thing in particular bothered her though, and she thought it wouldn't cause any major secrets to be revealed, so asked Harry about it. I started getting the Wizarding newspaper, to try and prepare myself for Hogwarts, and they have been promoting the boy who lives going to Hogwarts angle for months. The drawings they published of Harry Potter look nothing like you though, you've no scar or glasses. Apparently I had a scar when I first went to Gringotts but the healers dealt with it. As for the glasses, I can only assume they thought because my dad wore them that I would need them too. The books featured the same type of drawings, and also had my father asking where they got their information. None of them would say anything. Just then, they endured the first of many visits from people wanting to know if they'd seen Harry Potter. Boy Who Lived Fever was breaking out all over the express, with search parties hunting along the train for a sight of their elusive prey. Hermione noticed Harry's personality would change any time someone else entered the compartment, quickly reverting back as soon as they were alone again. She didn't want to ask him about it and ended up biting her bottom lip so as not to blurt something out. Harry must have seen the question in her expression though and answered her. The goblins claim to have three faces, the one the public sees, and then there is their true self. Their true self is reserved for family and friends. Harry smiled at her to ensure she knew he now counted her in this group. The final face is the last thing their enemies see just before they die. They may be bankers now but goblins are really warriors at heart. Hermione's curiosity got the better of her and another question slipped out before she could catch it. What was it like growing up with the goblins? Harry was enjoying talking about his life with someone else, this was not something usually available to him. I actually grew up as a goblin, though clearly I knew I was different. That goblins and wizards barely tolerate each other didn't help me any, I got into a lot of fights when I was younger. Hermione had her arms around him again, encouraging Harry to speak of things he never had before. Some of the adults weren't too pleased about the situation either, my dad is a powerful goblin who legally adopted me as his son. There were a couple of goblins who strongly objected, my father fought two duels to the death over me. Harry was drawing comfort from being held in his friend's arms, he found that once he began talking about this that he couldn't stop. He'd never had anyone to talk to about his life before. Had my father been defeated, I really don't know what would have happened to me. I needed to learn to stand on my own two feet as quickly as possible, and my father provided me with all the training I could handle. Being different actually worked in my favor for once. By the time I was six, I towered over all of the children in my classes. Now I'm taller than my father, though he can still kick my arse when we duel. He sounds like a wonderful man, sorry, goblin. That slip had Harry smiling again, allowing Hermione to reluctantly end their latest hug. I just call him father, and I'm sorry for unloading all this onto you. We've only just met today yet I feel I can trust you, please don't ask me to explain why. Hermione understood the amount of trust Harry was placing in her, and decided to reciprocate with some revelations of her own. I understand about being different Harry, I've been bullied since my first day of school because I was seen as different. I thought it was because I was a witch, only to discover today that I'm still different. Those witches that I spoke to wanted nothing to do with me, I'll be 12 in a few weeks and you are the first person who's ever wanted to be friends with me. Harry now had first-hand experience of how a hug could make you feel better, he decided his friend needed one so that's what he did. Hermione couldn't believe it, in the space of a few hundred miles she'd traveled from despair to being hugged by the most famous boy in her new world. That this went via crushing on a stranger to now having a best friend made the entire trip really magical. She was also struggling to comprehend just what he'd had to endure. Her dad had called down to her primary school a few times when the bullying got really bad but Harry's father had risked his life twice to protect his adopted son. Hermione didn't ever want to think about anything happening to her parents, yet Harry had already lost both of his and knew his adoptive father was fighting duels to the death to keep him safe. There and then Hermione decided that her new mission in life was to be the best friend she could to Harry, the first boy ever to hug her. They chatted for hours, 
growing closer and closer the further from home they got. As they finally approached their destination, the pair took turns at waiting outside the carriage while the other changed into their Hogwarts robes. Harry had one last word of warning for his new friend. Hermione, I'm half expecting trouble when I get to Hogwarts. Perhaps it would be better if... Hermione put an end to that avenue of thought in an instant. No Harry, whatever you were going to say there is no chance I'm going back to the way I was before getting on this train. You're my friend and that's more important than any school. The wide smile he gave her after this declaration did funny things to her stomach, Harry offering his arm saw her sporting a matching wide smile of her own. Shall we miss Granger? It was time for the public face. Delighted Mr. Crow. Oh. Hogsmeade Station hardly deserved the name, it had a platform to allow people access to and from the train and that was it. It also appeared to be in the middle of nowhere with the few lit lamps fighting a losing battle against the rapidly encroaching darkness as evening fell. It was to be expected that the temperature in the Scottish Highlands would be considerably lower than that of London, a fact that saw most of the older students pull their robes tighter around them and head directly to the waiting carriages. Harry and Hermione were halted from following their example by the appearance of a hairy man mountain holding a lantern aloft. First years. First years over here. The towering figure was soon surrounded by all the first years. He appeared to be looking for someone in particular, it was also obvious from his expression that he didn't find who he was looking for. Come on, follow me any more first years? Mind your step, now. First years follow me. They stumbled and slipped down a steep dark path that had Hermione mumbling a question to Harry, have they never heard of health and safety? They soon found the ground leveling off as they approached the shore of a dark body of water, it was the magnificent castle that seemed to grow out the mountain on the other side that demanded all their attention though. The castle was huge and had many turrets and towers, all sparkling with lights shining from the countless windows. Hogwarts was something straight out of the pages of a fairy tale. It was only the large man shouting that drew their attention to the fleet of little boats sitting on the shore. Hermione thought they were Coracles. No more and four to a boat. Harry helped Hermione into the boat before also offering his assistance to the twin sisters who had approached with the hope of sharing. The large man obviously had an entire boat to himself. He quickly checked that everyone was sitting in a boat before an order of forward saw the little craft slip fully onto the water and begin to make their way toward the castle. Parvati introduced both herself and her twin sister Padma Padil before proceeding to talk their ears off all the way across the lake. She appeared to have the annoying habit of asking a question and then providing her own answer. Her sister just sat quietly, probably immune to her twin's rantings by now. What house do you think you'll be in? I don't really mind since we're the first of our family to attend a British magical school. Have you any idea how we get sorted? I heard it was some sort of test, though one boy was claiming we had to wrestle a troll. Harry could see Hermione starting to slip into panic mode at this onslaught of questions, probably because she didn't have any answers. He literally couldn't move any closer so placed a comforting hand on her knee. My father told me an ancient magical artifact will decide which house we belong in. No tests, and certainly no trolls. Parvati now appeared much more interested in Harry's hand resting on Hermione's knee. This resulted in a barrage of personal questions, questions that neither of the two had any intention of answering. Only the boats entering a dark tunnel appeared to halt the verbal onslaught and soon they were disembarking onto a shingle beach. Harry was again a gentleman and helped all three girls out the boat. A long flight of stone steps ended at a massive oak door. Anything less than oak would surely have disintegrated when the enormous man pounded on it with his fist. The door was then opened by a black-haired witch in dark green robes, her entire demeanor screamed, Don't mess with me. The first years, Professor McGonagall, and he and amongst them. The big man appeared ready to burst into tears before the stern professor pulled him aside. Everyone could still hear their conversation though. Pull yourself together Hagrid, did you count them? The man they now knew was named Hagrid seemed affronted by this. Oh, course I did, all presentin', accounted for professor. It was only then that what McGonagall was implying hit Hagrid, 
they were all here so the person he was looking for must be amongst them. We'll just let the sorting ceremony answer that question. Hagrid went away happy while McGonagall began giving them a brief introduction to the Hogwarts houses, and what they stood for. Harry and Hermione hardly heard a word, it was clear to both of them just who the staff were looking for. As McGonagall left them for a moment to check how things were progressing, Harry took the opportunity to whisper to Hermione. Just remember, I can look after myself. He didn't get to say any more as the blonde boy, who'd been one of the students looking for Harry Potter on the train, decided to hold court. Harry Potter doesn't come to Hogwarts and they're all wetting themselves, pathetic. Do you know why he's not at Hogwarts? It's because he's dead. Do you really think a toddler could defeat the Dark Lord? Hermione saw this boy's words were making an impression and was desperate to intervene, especially as one or two of the girls appeared close to tears. This was not her secret to reveal though so once more she bit her bottom lip, Hermione reckoned this was something she was going to have to get used to. You're nothing but a liar Malfoy. Well, where is he Bones? Your aunt is the head of the Oriers, has she ever seen him? No one has seen hide or hair of Harry Potter since that night. My father often has the Minister of Magic over for dinner, and even the head of our ministry has never seen Harry Potter. If it wasn't for that oaf Hagrid spouting stories in the pub every time he gets drunk, no one would know anything about that night. One of the redheads, who'd also been looking for Harry on the train, reacted rapidly to Malfoy's claims. Dumbledore has seen the boy who lived, he's kept him safe from evil creeps like your father. Malfoy was more than a match for this verbal attack, he immediately taunted right back. Perhaps the great Dumbledore dropped him off at your hovel weasel. What's one more kid amongst your tribe? Does your mother even remember all your names? Harry Potter isn't here because he's dead, and dead people don't come to Hogwarts. This was met by screams, not against Malfoy but for the irrefutable proof he was wrong. A bunch of ghosts had just passed through the wall, and a few prospective first years. By the time the group had recovered from this shock, Professor McGonagall had returned to lead them into the Great Hall. Harry was now in full public face mode so Hermione tried to match his confident poise, the trouble was she felt anything but confident. Another downside to this was that both now stood out amongst their owing and awing peers. When the tattered old hat began its song, Hermione was left to wonder just how strange this new world was. A girl called Hannah Abbott was called forward first and sorted into Hufflepuff, it was soon clear the process was being carried out alphabetically by surname. When Vincent Crabbe headed off to join the green-trimmed robes of Hermione's earlier tormentors, both expected Harry to be next. When Tracy Davis' name was called, they knew something was up. Harry continually whispered reassurances that he could handle this but still had to practically push Hermione in the direction of the hat after her name was called. It didn't take long for the hat to place her in Ravenclaw. It was only after she was joined there by Padma Padil that the fun really started. McGonagall called for Harry Potter, and no one moved. You could feel the mood in the hall drop as none of the remaining students stepped forward. McGonagall, knowing that the number of students she started the sorting with corresponded to the total names on her list, called his name again, with the exact same lack of results. Hermione was gripping the wooden table hard enough to leave marks when Padma whispered a question to her. Why wasn't Harry's name called? She really could reply honestly. I don't know Padma, he should have been sorted before both of us. I just hope he gets into Ravenclaw, sorry you got separated from your sister. I'm not, was the last thing said before the deputy headmistress continued with the sorting. They were now down to just two boys left standing awaiting their turn under the hat. When McGonagall called on Blaze Zabinai, there was finally only one. As Blaze headed off to Slytherin, all eyes were now focused on Harry. What is your name son? Harry Crow Professor. McGonagall checked her list again to confirm what she already knew, there was only one name there she hadn't yet ticked. I don't seem to have you down here Harry. My father confirmed I would be attending, and the circumstances surrounding my attendance. This was Dumbledore's moment, he would force the boy to choose in front of the entire hall. 
Once that initial choice had been made, there would be no going back to this goblin nonsense. Dumbledore stood and waited until he had everyone's attention before speaking. Perhaps I can shed some light on the matter Professor McGonagall. I did indeed receive Mr. Crow's letter, and read the special circumstances he's alluding to. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to comply with those circumstances. This is Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, we have no accord or charter to accept a goblin into our school. The headmaster was noted for his quirkiness, one might even go as far as to suggest he was a touch mad. His comments had certainly shed no light on this matter as the boy left standing there was clearly not a goblin. Dumbledore wasn't finished though. If young Harry here wants to attend Hogwarts, it will need to be under the name his birth parents gave him. Harry James Potter Chapter 3 If young Harry here wants to attend Hogwarts, it will need to be under the name his birth parents gave him. Harry James Potter The silence that followed that announcement lasted mere seconds as everyone then attempted to shout at once. Dumbledore stood there with a satisfied smirk on his face and watched as the hall descend into chaos for a few moments. The boy simply wouldn't be able to refuse in front of all these witches and wizards, and then Harry would be back under his control. Albus would have until the summer holidays to find a suitable family to place the boy with, so there was no rush for that. McGonagall finally restored order to the hall before rounding on Harry. Is this true, are you Harry Potter? Harry and his father had prepared for his identity becoming publicly known, it was time to put those preparations to good use. The headmaster is well aware that my adoptive father for the last ten years has been Bark Hoke, senior accounts manager at Gringotts, and yes I was once called Harry Potter. The mayhem this time kicked off instantly and took longer to get back under control. Harry Potter had been raised by a goblin. A goblin he even called father. It was a shocked McGonagall who once more turned to Harry. How is this possible? I was there the night we left you with your muggle relatives. Hermione was of course watching her friend intently and thought she might just have caught a glimpse of Harry's third face. At McGonagall's revelation, he stood that bit straighter and stared directly into her eyes. Dangerous was the only word Hermione had to describe this version of Harry. And by what right did you participate in that atrocious event, deputy headmistress? The professor actually needed to take a step back at the venom radiating from those green eyes, before gathering her wits once more. I was a friend of your mother and father's. The rest of the school couldn't believe it when a student who hadn't even been sorted yet, cut right across the Hebridean dragon that was Minerva McGonagall. I think was is the operative word there. Don't expect any warm greetings should you ever meet them again. You did a great disservice to House Potter that night, as well as ignoring multiple laws set up to protect children. Are you sure you should be working in a school, Professor? The sarcasm Harry loaded the word Professor with couldn't be missed by even the thickest of Hogwarts students. In the silence that followed McGonagall's slapdown, Pudma grabbed Hermione's arm to get her attention. You knew. She could only nod by way of a reply, Harry had turned his attention back to Dumbledore and Hermione didn't want to miss anything. I thank you for providing me with this choice headmaster, it's rather an easy one to make. You see I was very happy at my goblin school and never wanted to attend Hogwarts in the first place, it was my father who urged me to come here. I shall now be able to return home and tell him I tried my best but was neither welcome nor wanted. The Hermione Granger who'd left Crawley that morning would probably have placed being expelled from school marginally below being killed in her list of catastrophic things that could happen to her. This Hermione Granger though had traveled to a different country and a whole other world had opened up for her. This Hermione Granger now had a best friend and was not about to lose him. Ignoring Harry's repeated claims that he could handle himself, she shot out her seat and rushed to his side. Hermione. If you're leaving, then I'm going too. Draco Malfoy was seething with anger. He'd made a big play to establish who was the kingpin amongst the first years and now looked like a complete fool. Harry Potter had kept his silence, standing there and deliberately letting him dig a deeper hole for himself. Draco had never been so humiliated in his life. 
His father's instructions were to befriend the boy and then attempt to convert him to their way of thinking, you didn't need to be a genius to see that would never work now. His anger led to him loudly opening his mouth when he probably shouldn't have, his voice clearly discernible over the hubbub Harry's proposed leaving was causing. Goblins in another mudblood? Just when we thought the once proud Potter name couldn't sink any lower. Harry left Hermione standing there beside a still shocked McGonagall and purposefully walked toward Malfoy. The blonde Slytherin was supremely confident. He was amongst his own house with his godfather sitting at the staff table. He was also certain he could take whatever verbal mutterings Potter came up with and turn them back against him. Draco nonchalantly stood to meet the advancing Potter but was totally unprepared for what happened next. Harry walked right up to Malfoy and his hand was a blur as it powerfully backhanded him across the mouth, throwing Draco back onto the Slytherin table. You are a disgusting example of what inbreeding can cause, I challenge you to an honor duel. Albus had been shocked at the boy's refusal to attend Hogwarts, nearly as much as his verbal assault on Minerva. He'd let this situation develop to see if it could be turned to his advantage, the headmaster seized the opportunity that presented itself here. Just how do you intend to fight a duel Harry, when you consider yourself a goblin and Mr. Malfoy is clearly a wizard? You are aware the law prohibits goblins from using wands. Had I been allowed to attend Hogwarts, you would have found I'm well versed in both wizard and goblin law. Perhaps if you had studied our laws more you would not have been barred from doing business with Gringotts for the last decade. Then again, you don't appear to pay too much attention to wizarding law either, they just allow you to get away with it. You could be forgiven for thinking that the occupants of the Great Hall were all shocked out, given what had happened before. This revelation though drew loud gasps of astonishment, almost exclusively amongst those old enough to understand what being barred from Gringotts entailed. They had no way of knowing that the night was still young and there was a lot more to come. I am quite prepared to duel Mr. Malfoy here while he uses his wand, I have my own weapon. Harry withdrew a custom-made blade from his sleeve. It had a beautifully carved Hungarian horntail fang as its handle with a razor-sharp stiletto-style goblin-forged blade protruding at least six inches from the grip. Even in the Great Hall's candlelit atmosphere. The blade seemed to capture whatever light was available and reflect back just how deadly a weapon this was. The knife's overall appearance greatly resembled that of a stillest wand. I'm afraid I can't let you do that Harry. Harry now verbally cut across Dumbledore too. You actually left me no other option, the entire school faculty sat there and let this moron get away with publicly insulting me and my family. Severus Snape was acutely aware of his godson's abilities, or lack of. Draco being defeated in a duel his first evening in Hogwarts would destroy the boy's credibility. He was forced to take action. Mr. Malfoy, 10 points from Slytherin. Draco would have loved to rant against the injustice of that punishment, the silk hanky now held against his mouth in an attempt to halt the flow of blood prevented him from doing so. Harry gave a slight bow to the professor. My honor is satisfied, though my curiosity is not. Was the ten points a punishment for the slight on my birth parents, my goblin father or Miss Granger's circumstances of birth? Harry didn't expect an answer and wasn't disappointed. As I suspected, a combined total for all three. Come on Hermione, time to get out of here. That piece of filth publicly calls you the foulest name imaginable and gets docked three points for it, and that only after I threatened to cut him to pieces. He offered Hermione his arm as the pair headed for the door. Phileas Flitwick suddenly found a lot of things becoming clearer for him. He'd felt slightly ostracized by the goblin community for years now and couldn't figure out what he'd done to deserve it. These occurrences were beginning to make sense since discovering Dumbledore was barred from Gringotts. Albus was his boss, therefore he was tainted with the headmaster's crime by simple association. It was time to make inroads into repairing his goblin relationships, starting with calling this young boy by his proper name. Harry Crow, son of Bark Hoke, can I inquire how you intend to travel home? Harry turned and this time his bow was much deeper, it also was done with genuine respect. Well met Master Flitwick, our director actually named me Old Crow but you weren't to know that. 
My father calls me Harry Crow so I won't forget my other roots. My father is a wise goblin who also provided me with a port K at home. I will activate it as soon as we clear the Hogwarts wards. I promise on my honor to see Miss Granger safely home. Well met old crow, child of James and Lily, son of Bark Hook, prophesied one. Hermione had her hand on Harry's arm and felt him stiffen at that, he didn't give any other sign though. They both turned to see it was the sorting hat that had spoken those words, but the old hat was just getting started. Your father is indeed a wise goblin Harry Crow, he knows you must come to Hogwarts to fulfill your destiny. Hogwarts is prepared to welcome you, and grant all that welcome entails. Dumbledore was not happy with that decision. I am the Hogwarts headmaster. Only as long as the castle allows. The hat's declaration was followed by a loud clang of a bell being struck, a bell that hadn't been heard inside the castle in living memory. Hogwarts had clearly spoken. Headmasters come and go but Hogwarts prevails. This school was devised and built by the four founders to teach magic to all those able to perform it, not so some supposed elite fraternity could lord it over everyone else. Hogwarts needs to unite in the face of the coming darkness less all will be lost. Come and sit Harry Crow, let me sort you. Harry knew his father thought his future was tied to Hogwarts, the hat's actions had just confirmed that. He looked to Hermione for her opinion. What do you think? Well, we're already here, and you'll still be able to take us home if we change our minds. I'll go and keep you a seat at the Ravenclaw table. Her gaze for that last comment was aimed at the old hat, clearly indicating that any other result was unacceptable. Harry smiled at her before sitting on the stool and placing the hat on his head. Dumbledore was livid, he was left standing there looking like the court jester while the main action happens elsewhere. The sorting hat was correct though. One could only be headmaster if the castle allowed. Without Hogwood's cooperation, he wouldn't even be able to access his office. Albus would just have to console himself with the fact that Harry would be here, available to be influenced by his headmaster. The sorting hat was busily scanning the young boy whose head it was now sitting on. Oh I am glad to see you easily qualify for membership to Rowena's house. I feel you'll need the friendship of Miss Granger and leadership of Master Flitwick during your stay with us. Therefore it has to be Ravenclaw. Hermione was on her feet, leading the cheering from a surprised Ravenclaw house, they all had thought the boy who lived couldn't go anywhere but Greyfinder. The applause from the House of the Lions was at best muted. This boy had just stridden over to the Slytherin table and decked a snake, he then even forced Snape to take points from his own house. How the hell could he be sorted anywhere else but Greyfinder? A pair of red-headed twins summed up the feelings of the entire house by continually asking the question, we didn't get Potter. As Harry stood to cheering from his new housemates, he felt a thud on top of his head just before he removed the hat. Reaching into the tattered ancient relic, he removed a bejeweled but definitely deadly goblin forged sword. The blade was engraved with the name of Godric Greyfinder. The hat had more to say. Your heritage allows you to draw that sword, and your training prepared you to wield it. That sword acknowledges you as Hogwarts champion. A scabbard appeared on the stool that Harry soon had expertly fastened around him, the shoulder sash proclaimed Ravenclaw across his chest. He then sheathed his new blade before handed the sorting hat back to an astonished McGonagall. Mr. Crow, I shall expect you in my office directly after the feast. I will have to disappoint you headmaster, the law won't allow that. Since you are barred from Gringotts, you can't be alone with any goblin miner. My father must be present in any discussions we have. Harry respectfully bowed once more to Flitwick before handing over a scroll to his new head of house. Here is a copy of the instructions the headmaster intended to ignore. Can I ask who Professor Snape is? All eyes then turned toward the greasy-haired teacher he'd previously dealt with, Harry again gave the short version of his bow. No offense to your person or your professionalism sir but you fall under the same laws of distrust as the headmaster. Since it was only his word that prevented you being sent to Azkaban as a Death Eater, and the goblins certainly have no faith in Dumbledore's word, I shall not be attending any of your classes. I, and any of my friends I ask to join me, 
will be receiving private potions tuition. Phileas intended to study the scroll at his leisure but simply had to speak to the boy, if only to end the unbelievably strained silence his last remark had caused in the hall. No one was quite sure how to react to how things were developing here. The tension in the air was so thick, you could cut the atmosphere with a knife. You seem well acquainted with the blade Mr. Crow, can I assume you've had the proper training? Harry's eyes twinkled as he answered his head of house. Master Sharp's heart asked me to pass on his regards, he spoke highly of you sir. The diminutive professor thought there must be something wrong with his hearing. You trained under Master Sharp's heart. Harry nodded, I was honored to have him as one of my mentors. Harry strolled over to where Hermione was keeping him a seat, leaving a now totally bewildered staff table behind. Dumbledore was so shocked at the previous revelations, he forgot all about his pre-feast announcements and just waved his hand for the food to appear. Secrets that he'd kept hidden for years had just been broadcast to the entire school. Minerva eventually sat beside the headmaster and her expression was thunderous. I'm calling a full staff meeting for tonight, and you better have some answers for me Albus. I don't like being made a fool of in front of the entire school especially by a first year. That acceptance letter should have come to me and I'll be wanting to know why it didn't. It must also have conveniently slipped your mind that Harry was no longer at Privet Drive when I frequently asked after his welfare over the last decade. Any appetite Albus had left disappeared with that. After the evening he'd just had, the last thing he needed was Minerva on the warpath. When he looked down the other side of the table, Severus appeared ready to render young Harry down into potion ingredients. This was not how he foresaw tonight's sorting proceeding. Phileas had also noted his fellow head of house's vicious demeanor, and where his poisoned glare was directed. He decided some intervention was in order. That was a smart move tonight Severus, young Malfoy's mouth invited trouble he was ill-equipped to handle. Knowing at least one of Mr. Crow's trainers, I can safely say he would have made mince meat of Mr. Malfoy. Severus' answer was dripping with barely contained anger. I intend to confiscate those weapons of Potter's as soon as this feast is over. First years with knives and swords, this place is certainly going downhill. Phileas couldn't let that pass. I'm afraid you can't do that Severus. Hogwarts has accepted Mr. Crow as a goblin student, with all the circumstances that acceptance entails. Mr. Crow is not allowed a wand, but does have permission to carry a blade. Asking a goblin to surrender his blade is an even worse faux pas than demanding a wizard hand over his wand. The boy is an arrogant little Torag, just like his father. Not even sorted and already making demands, he should have been allowed to leave the castle. I think you'll find that was the lad's intention, until Hogwarts herself intervened. I didn't know you'd met Barkhoak but I would recommend not insulting him, or his son. Phileas held up his hand to forestall Severus' objections that he knew would be coming. Obviously Mr. Crow is not a goblin, he is instead a wizard who has chosen to live his life by their customs and laws. What is the one thing all young witches and wizards are taught about goblins? Never mess with them. Potter is a first year student at Hogwarts, nothing more. Calling him Potter in that derogatory manner could see you kicked out of Gringotts, or challenged to a duel by the lad's father. I would remind you that goblins fight duels to the death. Should you or your snakes deliberately provoke the lad, he will react as a goblin would. His honor will dictate his actions, we've already caught a glimpse of those actions tonight. Have you ever heard of someone being chosen as Hogwarts champion before? Harry Crow is no ordinary first year and you would be foolish to think otherwise. Harry sat down beside Hermione and noticed the entire Ravenclaw table staring at him. Eh hi, I'm Harry. This proved too much for Hermione, she'd been wound tighter than any watch since stepping off the train. Her accumulated tension found its release as she burst out laughing. If ever there was an unnecessary introduction, that was it. With the food now appearing on the table, the ice was well and truly broken. Pudma congratulating him for getting into Ravenclaw saw the floodgates open as questions poured in Harry's direction. He began eating and politely ignored most of the personal questions, though did admit he had no idea what a Hogwarts champion actually did. 
A pretty Chinese girl was already making cow eyes at Harry, which was in turn making Hermione's blood boil. Oh Harry, can I see your sword? Harry slowly finished what he was chewing before looking directly into the girl's eyes to give his answer. Why miss, that's a rather personal question, and we haven't even been introduced. He then turned to his friend with a question. Hermione, what is that? The entire table was now laughing at a floundering Cho Chang, while a beaming Hermione was explaining to Harry what pasta was. An older boy introduced himself as Roger Davies before trying to give Harry a heads up. You have no idea how popular you're going to be with the rest of the first years. The very thought of potions lessons without Snape will soon have them clamoring to be your friend. I just wish you were in third year to get me out the man's class. He's usually vile to anyone who's not a Slytherin, and that was before you announced to the entire hall he was a Death Eater. Harry glanced questioningly toward Hermione, private tuition with Harry was always going to get a yes from her. He then turned his gaze to Padma, the girl was blushing furiously but quickly accepted. Some of the older students were telling us stories about his classes on the train. Losing points for breathing too loudly. Harry again thought a young lady was pulling his leg until older members of his new house started recalling experiences that were even worse than that one. This was a situation they had not foreseen and he would need to speak with his father before inviting anyone else to private potions lessons. As the stories of Snape's abuses got worse, the other six first-year claws were now casting longing glances in Harry's direction. He was sure though that Dumbledore would have his father coming to Hogwarts before the week was out, Harry could ask him then. Dumbledore was left having to make his planned announcements after the feast had finished. The headmasters, avoid the third floor corridor unless you want to die a most painful death, did not sit well on top of all that rich food. Hermione was looking along the Ravenclaw table for some guidance on how to react to that instruction, the shrugs of shoulders she received as answers had the young witch asking another question. He does know this is a school, right? Oh. The prefects led them out of the hall towards Ravenclaw Tower, their new home for the next seven years. Penelope was busy explaining about the bronze door knocker asking them to solve a riddle when the door unexpectedly opened. This particular puzzle was beyond the two Ravenclaw prefects until the knocker itself provided the answer. A Hogwarts champion can go anywhere inside the castle, all doors are open to him. M, okay. So if you can't solve the riddle, you need to wait for someone who can, or just stick with Harry. Penelope may have intended that as a joke but Hermione had already made her mind up that's what she was going to do, and not just so she could avoid answering riddles. They entered the Ravenclaw common room before being divided by gender as the prefects also split to show each of them where they would be staying. Harry was pleased to see a single room with a good-sized four-poster bed waiting on him. He removed his shrunken trunk from his pocket, placing it at the bottom of his bed before restoring it to normal size. There were places for their clothes and not much else though. The prefect explained this was to encourage the first years to study together, and there was a specific area of the common room set aside especially for them to do this. Harry headed back down the stairs to the common room, and was not surprised to find Hermione waiting there. Harry felt he had to say something about earlier tonight. Thanks for standing by me down there, that meant a lot. I found it hard to believe you were ready to walk out of here, after being so excited about coming to Hogwarts in the first place. Well, I was hoping to use the journey home to convince you about me attending Goblin School. This drew a slight laugh from Harry, a port K I would have had us to London in under a minute, not that I would have needed a lot of convincing mind you. Thanks also for not asking loads of questions, I can see how hard that is for you sometimes. Hermione actually pouted at that. You have no idea how hard I have to bite my lip, but I console myself by thinking that I already know more about you than anybody else. I hope one day we'll be close enough where you'll be able to tell me whatever's on your mind. The sorting hat calling you, prophesied one, seemed to shake you more than pulling that sword out the hat. There are some things I just can't talk about Hermione, and that is one of them. You are right though, you do know more about me than I had intended to reveal. One day, I might even be able to tell you everything. 
I'm already looking forward to it. It was time for bed now but neither was quite sure how friends said goodnight to each other. Hermione's insecurities began to resurface as she asked Harry one last question. Will we go down to breakfast together? Harry's answer of, every morning, had Hermione hugging him again. Saying goodnight like this just felt so right that both of them went to their new rooms very happy with this part of their Hogwarts experience. Oh. Albus wasn't experiencing much happiness at the impromptu staff meeting, Minerva was demanding answers and he was loath to give any secrets away. After the boys' earlier revelations though, this had to be treated as a damage limitation exercise. He also decided to stick mostly to the truth, just not all of it. If you can remember back, we were all exceedingly busy after that Halloween. The very first day of the Christmas holidays, I headed off to Privet Drive to check on young Harry's welfare. You can imagine my shock when I discovered Harry wasn't there. Albus saw no reason why he shouldn't embellish his tale to show a certain headmaster in the best possible light. Disley had totally ignored my clearly written instructions, he just didn't believe there could be any danger to him or his family. Not only did he refuse to raise Harry, he somehow managed to find his way to Gringotts. He deposited Harry there like some parcel, the Disleys thought it was best that young Harry be raised by his own kind. This caused eruptions amongst the staff, up in arms at that last comment. You are not saying anything I didn't impress upon Disley at my visit. His answer was that all magic users were the same to him. He and his wife apparently signed some magically binding banking agreement that tied young Harry to Gringotts until he reaches his majority. Tonight, I was hoping to see that agreement broken and have him attending Hogwarts as Harry Potter, we all saw how that went. Phileas was angry at the blatant bigotry being displayed here, that the charms master considered some of these people friends fueled his temper. That was a predictable, and also very foolish move Albus. You almost lost us the very thing you were supposedly trying to save. All eyes had now moved to Phileas, but it was Minerva who asked her friend to explain his comments. The boy has spent the last ten years living as a goblin, he's not about to renounce that upbringing at his first glimpse of an enchanted ceiling. Phileas was encouraged to say more, his own heritage making him the acknowledged expert here. If I'm reading this correctly, his father has sent the lad here to be amongst magical children his own age. For what purpose? To help his son make the impossible decision he'll be faced with in a few years. Whether to live his life as a wizard or a goblin. Snape blew his top at that. What a load of hippogriff shit. The boy is a wizard, end of story. Phileas though was equally as angry, and wasn't about to back down. Just like you are a death eater, yet are here teaching children. Life is all about choices Severus, and you would be making a stupid one if you continue reaching for that wand. Dumbledore reiterated his head of Ravenclaw's warning. There will be no wands drawn here. Please continue Phileas, you are highlighting things I hadn't even considered. We have to look at this from a goblin perspective. Old Crow living the rest of his life as a goblin, or Lord Potter taking his place in magical society which would benefit the goblin nation most. That Lord Potter would be an influential member of that society goes without saying. Having someone who was goblin raised in the very top echelons of magical society would be an unbelievable coup for Gringotts. Minerva was struggling with what her friend was trying to explain here. Are you saying his goblin father sent Harry here so he would eventually accept being a wizard? Phileas was nodding. I can see no other reason that makes sense, they must want Harry to gradually accept his place in the British magical community. Why else would they send him to Hogwarts when they have such a severe grievance with Albus? They are certainly well aware that other magical schools are available. Can you see Bo's batons rejecting Harry Potter, whatever conditions were attached to his attendance? Phileas never really expected an answer to his question. The entire room knew Harry Potter could turn up there calling himself Napoleon Bonaparte and still be welcomed with open arms. Goblins are barely tolerated by wizards inside Gringotts, those same wizards won't even give them the time of day outside their bank. In the muggle world, goblins stand out like clowns in a circus. 
Harry Potter singing the praises of goblins would go a long way to changing attitudes in our society, and perhaps even gain a toehold in the Muggle one too. We all know about Lily Evans' heritage, and it would appear young Harry has already befriended a Muggle-born witch. This was the best news Albus had heard all night, he was back in the game. Good, that will give me some bargaining tools when dealing with this goblin. I think we should meet Bark Hoke as soon as possible. Albus, you are already persona non grata with the goblins. Trying to make demands of Bark Hoke will get you nowhere, and could see you kicked out the castle. In any choice between you and Harry, Hogwarts has already made her decision clear. He is her champion, a position last held by Godric Greyfinder I believe. Minerva ignored Dumbledore's crestfallen expression and raised a real concern she had with teaching the lad. How is he going to manage in my class without a wand? Mr. Crow may be able to cope in subjects where one isn't needed but charms, transfiguration and defense all require one. I really don't know Minerva but I will say this, he wouldn't have been sent here if he couldn't do it. Many years ago, I was faced with a similar choice to Harry. Everyone here knows I'm of mixed heritage, I chose to be a wizard and was therefore allowed a wand. If they have somehow circumvented his need for a wand to perform magic, convincing Harry to make the same choice I did just got a lot more difficult. Pomona Sprout had quickly recognized that Phileas was indeed the expert here. The head of Hufflepuff wanted to know just what effect having a goblin attend classes would have, and if she would need to give any special instructions to her puffs. Just treat Harry the same as any other first year. Phileas ignored Snape's sneering, finally some sense, and continued with his advice, please inform me if you come across any specific problems, I will approach him in regard to not having a wand tomorrow morning. The meeting then broke up but the four heads of house remained behind, Minerva soon got the ball rolling. I'm assuming you know what the sorting hat was talking about when it called the child prophesied one. I'm also assuming you have no intention of sharing that with us. Albus replied in that infuriatingly calm way of his. You are of course correct in both your assumptions Minerva, that is something that should never have been mentioned in such a public place. She had expected no other answer. What about, handling the school's finances would be good experience for you Minerva, give you practice for when you're headmistress. In light of the fact we now know you were barred from doing business with Gringotts at the time, would you agree you are a manipulative, lying bastard? Minerva never gave Albus time to conjure more lies, she just kept right on after him. Every time you told me Harry Potter was fine was nothing but a bloody lie, you had no idea of the child's condition or welfare. He could have been locked in a cupboard for all you knew. What will you do when this story breaks, as you know it must? My great age has at least taught me at least one thing. Problems are like bridges, best crossed when you come to them. And the scar you wanted to leave young Harry with? It looks as if that was another of your decisions the goblins didn't agree with. It would appear so Minerva. Since you've spent the last ten years lying to me, you no longer have the right to use that name headmaster. Oh, and get that thing out the third floor corridor otherwise I'll go over your head and see it's taken care of myself. It would be a shame to have a decade of experience running this place and not get the chance to be headmistress. It goes or you do. Minerva marched out of Dumbledore's office, her threat hung there though, as real as any of the paintings in the room. Pomona, could you please tell Minerva that there is really no point in heading for little whining. The Disleys had moved by the time I went back to have more discussions with them that summer. Pomona left to check on her friend but Phileas had a parting comment for the two who were going to remain. Mr. Crow is a Ravenclaw, and bound by law not to associate with both of you. If I should discover either of you attempting to break that law, I'm willing to see how much of Master Silvershard's teachings I remember. Phileas strode out of there, leaving two thoughtful figures behind. It was Snape who finally broke the painful silence. Do you think the brat knows about the prophecy? The boy knows far too much for my liking. Oh. Hermione was up early and hurrying down to the common room, she didn't want there to be the slightest chance she would miss Harry for breakfast. Not only did she not miss Harry, Hermione ran right into him as he raced through the Ravenclaw entrance. 
This collision had an unexpected effect on the young witch, it solidified Hermione's views on the three faces of her friend. His first was clearly Harry, the boy who had sat and chatted for hours with her on the train yesterday. His second face was the one he showed the public, Hermione considered this his Harry Crow personality, with a touch of pride and prejudice thrown in for good measure. The young witch now had his third persona clearly etched in her mind, and what a picture it was. Gone was any pretense of the suave Mr. Darcy, Hermione thought this Harry was more likely to be the son of Zeus and Hera. Here was a young Ares who was obviously in training, and he looked very good for it. His hair was tied back in a short ponytail and Harry now wore his new sword strapped on his back. It was the Roman-like tunic, made of some animal hide, that really held her attention though. That it fitted him like a second skin really emphasized his physique, Hermione couldn't help but think Harry was amazingly developed for someone his age. His tunic was as black as his hair and glistened nearly as much as a clearly sweating Harry. She also just happened to notice that the tunic stopped well above his knees. He offered his apology for running into her before mumbling something about needing a shower. Saying he would be back down shortly, Harry then headed up the stairs at speed. Unable to take her eyes off him, Hermione watched Harry every step of the way. Hermione giggled to herself, laughing at the thought of her mum and dad's reactions to the first letter she would be writing home. Her parents were in for quite a few shocks from their bookish daughter. Not only did she have a best friend at Hogwarts, Hermione needed her mum to send some exercise clothes as soon as possible. If morning exercises made Harry look that good, then Hermione Granger just had to give it a try. Chapter 4 Hermione was sitting at breakfast, contemplating over her sausage, egg, and bacon how anyone's life could change as much as hers had in the space of just a few days. Of course, to say the boy sitting next to her played a part in that would be a massive understatement. The more she got to know Harry, the more of an enigma he became. Even his owl had to be different. Not only was it a beautiful snowy owl, Harry claimed Irgit was a free spirit that would never allow herself to be placed in a cage. She'd flown ahead to Hogwarts and just arrived on his shoulder whenever he wanted to send a letter to his father. The graceful bird of prey had also taken Hermione's first letter home to Crawley. That this beautiful bird was named after a goblin Harry had read about in a history book was something she approved of. That was until she discovered the goblin's full name was Irgit the Ugly, and the goblin was male. Harry shrugged it off as goblin humor but Hermione felt an involuntary shudder travel down her spine, she suddenly had this image of Harry naming one of his children Albus Severus. That just wasn't funny no matter what culture you ran it through, both men gave Hermione the creeps. For some reason, the headmaster seemed to embody everything her parents had continually warned their little girl about as she grew up. Don't talk to strangers and never accept sweets from strangers had been recurring themes from her mum and dad. Perhaps it was because Hermione couldn't think of anyone she'd ever met being stranger than the headmaster. He tried hard to portray himself as a jovial grandfather figure but, every time he looked at Harry, his eyes betrayed him. This put Albus Dumbledore near the top of Hermione's shit list. Top spot was already taken though, the school's resident potions professor was way out in front. When Dumbledore looked at Harry, it was more covetous. Like Harry had something the headmaster really wanted. With Snape, it was pure, unadulterated, and undisguised hatred. She was very grateful that they wouldn't have to take any strolls down to his dungeon lair. Snape just screamed, black and white horror movie creep, to the young witch. Give him a mustache he could twirl the ends of and he would be the perfect archetypal villain. Suddenly she had this image of him as Dick Dastardly, with Malfoy starring as Muttley. Harry drew Hermione out of her daydreaming by offering a canute for her thoughts. Oh I was just wondering about today's lessons. We've got transfiguration this morning, you and Professor McGonagall didn't exactly hit it off at the sorting. Harry laughed at her last comment, well, that's certainly one way of putting it. Our lessons so far have been a really mixed bag. Herbology was great and Professor Sprout really knows her stuff, history of magic was a joke. Harry, with your goblin sense of humor, that last remark could mean anything. 
We were learning about famous wizards and the impact they'd left on the world, how could anyone possibly make that sound boring? Even a goblin wouldn't think a class of children being taught by a ghost was something to laugh about. Speaking of laughable, that's really the only word I can think of to describe our defense professor. That loud red-headed Greyfinder broke wind as Quirrell walked past his desk, and our brave defense professor almost jumped six feet in the air with fright. Hermione was trying not to laugh at that memory, the defense professor appeared as nervous as a stray kitten in a dog pound. She agreed with Harry and added her own critique of the Hogwarts curriculum. Charms looks really interesting but I just wish we had gotten to try a few of them. Hopefully I'll get to use my wand in Transfiguration. They were interrupted by Irjit swooping down with a letter for Harry, and a parcel for Hermione. Harry's questioning raised eyebrow had Hermione blushing. I asked my mum to send me some exercise clothes, I was hoping I could join you for a bit of training in the morning. This had Harry smiling. Okay, but I think we should wait until Saturday morning before beginning. That will give you a couple of days to get used to the training without having to attend classes too. He then opened his own note, nodding as the news was expected. My father is coming to Hogwarts tomorrow, we have a meeting with Dumbledore. I wonder if Master Flitwick knows. Father can decide tomorrow if we want him in there with us. We better head off to class. Harry was either stuck in some chivalrous period, or that goblin sense of humor was having a laugh at her expense. Either way, wherever they went, Harry offered his arm and she gratefully took it. She didn't know if this increased the whispering that followed Harry wherever he went, and didn't really care. Last night she was on his arm under the stars. It may have only been their astronomy lesson but that's not the way Hermione chose to remember it, it was easily the most romantic night of her young life. They began walking toward the Transfiguration class, with all the portraits making sure the Hogwarts champion knew exactly where he was going. Quite a number of the other first years had sussed this out so they tended to have an entourage between classes. Pudma usually stuck quite close to them and all three were fine with that, it was the rest that were now becoming ridiculous. Not all of them were content to just follow on to class. Parvati and that other Gryffindor girl were desperately trying to attach themselves like limpets to Harry. The Gryffindor boys though were becoming even more pushy, especially the red-headed one. Hey Harry mate, you must get fed up hanging around with the bookworms. Anytime you want a break, the Gryffindor guys will make you more than welcome. Harry just looked at him, and you are. Oh sorry, I'm Ron. Harry's stare never wavered, and who are you? He didn't appear to get what Harry was asking. I'm Ron, this is Dean and Seamus and he's Neville. Well, Mr. Ron Ron, thanks for introducing you and your friends. Now, if you will excuse me. Harry pushed past him toward the boy hanging at the back, since Hermione still had Harry's arm she followed on. Well met Neville Longbottom, I'm Harry Crow and, since you are practically family, please call me Harry. The young lady on my arm is Hermione Granger and this is our friend Padma Padil, her twin sister is in Gryffindor with you. Neville stared unbelievingly at Harry's offered hand before nervously shaking it. Hi everybody, eh family. Did you know my mum was your godmother? This was clearly news to Neville, but not as shocking as the next bit. Your mother is also my godmother. The boy appeared ready to cry at that but Harry now had his hand comfortingly on Neville's shoulder and Hermione had moved by his side. Voldemort cost both of us Neville, but I think you got the worst of the deal. There is no way you should now have to put up with a Death Eater teaching you. I would like to offer you the opportunity to join us for separate potion lessons. Are you sure? The pleading nature of Neville's demeanor at Harry's offer was heartbreaking to watch. He clearly had no self-esteem and couldn't work out why anyone would make such an offer to him. Harry responded the only way he knew how, honestly. I'm very sure Neville. Both the offers of private lessons and friendship are genuine, this is not some sick prank. Had things been different, we would have grown up together and I'm certain been best friends. We may have lost years but I would like us both to start down that road now. The smile now on Neville's face was all the answer Harry needed and the four resumed their journey to transfiguration.
Neville gave the impression of someone who'd just had the weight of the world lifted off his shoulders, he explained this as they walked. Snape terrifies me, and we've heard he saves his worst behavior for Gryffindors. Ron's been trying to catch your eye all week, we're all desperate to get out of Snape's class. I've had the people in my own house dropping subtle hints all week too. The problem is that, when my father arranged this, it was supposed to be for me and hopefully a few friends. I can't really turn up with three quarters of first year without talking to my father again. He's coming to Hogwarts tomorrow so I might be able to help a few more out then, but I think I should offer places to my own house first. I would appreciate it if you could let slip to Ron Ron that I don't like pushy. Ah. It was plain to see that the penny had dropped for Neville so he blushingly offered an explanation. Parvati was moaning about how you appeared friends with Padma but practically ignored her, she couldn't understand it. The musical laughter coming from Padma cut Neville off. Oh pushy is a good description of Pav, there's a few other words I could use as well. So you're not identical then? Physically yes, but we're definitely two different witches. They chatted all the way to Transfiguration before doing their usual and sitting at the front of the class. Harry's bag was charmed weightless and bottomless and he insisted that both girls put their book bags in there too. He handed Hermione hers and was about to do the same with Padma when the redhead Greyfinder stepped over the line. He'd just pushed Neville out the way so he could claim the seat on the other side of Harry. What are you playing at? Ron was unrepentant. The boy who lived needs proper Greyfinder friends, not to be hanging about with Ravenclaw girls and Neville. The way you took down Malfoy was bloody brilliant. What Quidditch team do you support? Harry's gaze would have had anyone else in the class moving seats, Ron was too stupid to know he was in any trouble. Harry had to quickly decide the best way to play this. I paid Malfoy the compliment of at least admitting he could be dangerous. You, on the other hand, are an idiot. Padma and Hermione were already on their feet, guiding Neville to their new seats. Harry then joined them, leaving behind a livid Ron who was now stuck sitting at the front of the class. The reason he was stuck there was that a certain cat had just watched the entire incident, transforming into Professor McGonagall before Ron could move or even reply to the insult. Minerva decided that no action needed to be taken, she was actually delighted to see three Ravenclaws standing up for one of her cubs. That the youngest Weasley possessed the social skills of a troll was something that other members of staff had actually commented on. McGonagall's transformation from her cat form led the professor neatly into her introductory remarks about how transfiguration was some of the hardest magic they would learn. Transfiguring her desk into a pig was always something that caught and held the new first year's attention. McGonagall was continuing her well-honed introduction before noticing she didn't have the entire class full attention, one of them actually appeared bored. This had never happened before so she cut short her talk to discover what the problem was. Is there something you don't understand Mr. Crow? Basically, all of it Professor. McGonagall's lips tightened at this. Could you please be a trifle more specific Mr. Crow? Ron couldn't resist a jibe. It's because he's an idiot. The sniggering this caused was all the invitation Harry needed to shut them up. Well, I understood changing your desk into a pig was purely a demonstration, though not very practical one since you couldn't actually eat it. McGonagall didn't seem too pleased with that analysis but could hardly refute the facts, she grudgingly nodded in acceptance so Harry continued. It's all the different spell incantations and wand movements that confuse me. Since transfiguration is basically changing one thing into another, why do you need a different spell for every occasion? Transfiguration is one of the easiest branches of magic to master, you're just asking your magic to perform the same function over and over again. In all her years teaching, McGonagall had never came across this argument before. She could now see how someone who wasn't raised in their community could struggle with the concept. What you have failed to grasp Mr. Crow is the different types and complexities of transfiguration. We'll be starting off today attempting to turn matches into needles. Since they are approximately the same size, the spell has merely to tweak the shape and transfigure wood into metal. As we progress through the courses, 
we eventually move to configuring living material, which is much more complicated and taxing. That is where we are having the trouble professor, I've been taught the exact opposite. The only limitations governing the spell are the power and experience of the caster, and the mass of the initial object. Transforming your desk into a fly or an elephant is practically impossible because you are limited by the mass of material you start with. Whether that material is living or not is immaterial. I could probably transfigure my book into a pigeon but not a turkey, unless you know of a miniature variety. McGonagall was gobsmacked. If this boy was speaking the truth then everything she'd been taught, and in turn had taught others, was wrong. Minerva didn't know how she would deal with that. If this was a prank, Mr. Crow was going to find himself in detention to at least third year. There was one easy way to find out. Minerva had taught the Marauders and now the Weasley twins, she had no intentions of being caught by any prank book. Mr. Crow, I'm going to give you one of my books. If you can transfigure it into a chicken, I will give you a no, not for today but the entire year. She placed a rather large tome in front of him and fixed her beady eyes on it. The boy removed his knife and began to wave it over the book. Minerva watched in astonishment as the leather binding started to grow feathers before a head and neck appeared as the chicken took shape. McGonagall was speechless as the chicken bobbed its head and strutted over the desk, it was left to Hermione to ask Harry the questions. You never said any incantations or performed a recognized wand movement, how is this possible? Hermione, I speak English, Spanish, French and a smart hearing of Italian. Do you think it makes a difference what you say, or what language you say it in, to your magic as it does what you want? Oh I of course speak goblin, though I refuse to use the derogatory terms wizards refer to that language as. Hermione had never heard about this before so asked. What do wizards call it? It was Neville who answered her. Gobbledygook. Hermione's sense of injustice sprang to the fore. What? That means talking gibberish, and is very insulting. McGonagall had found her voice again and didn't want the issue sidetracked. Leaving goblin slash wizard relations aside for the moment, I would like to hear a fuller answer to Miss Granger's initial question. Harry waved his knife over the chicken and it slowly transformed into a basket. Chicken in a basket? I suppose this is more of the fabled goblin humor. Harry couldn't help but smile at Hermione's friendly jibe. He once more performed the goblin equivalent of the transformation spell and the basket became the cutest ginger kitten he could visualize. A tiny meow and the kitten sauntered over to Hermione, it was soon on her knee and receiving the cuddles and petting it deserved. Hermione thought this was her idea of heaven. A kitten she could play with that would eventually turn back into a book, it didn't get any better than that. Harry. You have so got to teach me how to do that. Harry now gave McGonagall, and the rest of the class the answer they were waiting for. Once you master the basic transfiguration spell, it's then all about being able to visualize what you want the item to transform into and practice, lots and lots of practice. I can transfigure items up to about the size of a medium dog. The bigger the item though, the slower my transfiguration will be. It will get quicker with practice and larger items will come as I get older. Minerva had been a transfiguration prodigy and now held a mastery in the subject, an 11 year old goblin trained wizard had just totally destroyed everything she held to be true. She was a powerful witch but couldn't even contemplate repeating the feat this boy just achieved when she was the same age. It wasn't just that though, Harry Crow just threw the transfiguration rule book out the window. Where the hell did they go from here? Your method makes no concessions to the initial item or the finished product. Oh some things are definitely harder to transfigure, usually because of the visualization. A chicken is a lot more complicated an item than the book was, again it's down to practice and more practice. It's taken me a few years to get to this stage, and it will take a lot more to get where I want to go. I won't have to learn different spell incantations or wand movements for every change though. Draco was livid that once more Crow was the center of attention, he was a Slytherin though and had learned from his last experience. It was time to get someone else to fight the battle. Professor, I thought the law prevented goblins possessing wands. 
Crow is surely breaking that law. Harry passed the knife over his original book a few times and it transformed into a pumpkin. This was certainly a misshaped pumpkin, it was a fair likeness for the head of Draco Malfoy. A couple of slashes with his knife and Harry had cut himself a slice of pumpkin, right down the center of Draco's face. Anytime Mr. Malfoy wants a demonstration that this is a knife, I will be more than happy to oblige. It's obviously not made of wood and doesn't have a recognized wand core running through it, therefore, according to official ministry definition, it is not a wand. Before you quote the law, can I suggest that you at least look it up first? Minerva thought that might be all the prescribed first year transfiguration book was good for now, as a demonstration tool. She placed the spell incantation on the blackboard, along with diagrams of the wand movements needed, before handing out the matches. Minerva then sat at her desk to see how this played out. As she expected, Miss Granger and the Ravenclaw Poddle sister both looked to Harry, wanting to try his method. Minerva couldn't miss that the other Ravenclaws and Mr. Longbottom were also hanging on his every word, totally ignoring her instructions on the board. That five of this group, not including Mr. Crow, had successfully transformed their match before the lesson ended meant that she would have to take this to the headmaster. In her 35 years teaching, her previous best result was three students performing the transformation before the end of their first period. Usually, Minerva was lucky to get one. That none of the students who had stuck to the method on the board got anything like a needle just compounded the issue. She dismissed the excited class without moving from her desk. McGonagall had never lost control of a class before but who would want to continue with the prescribed instructions when the goblin method had just been proven to be clearly superior? She would have to approach Phileas for access to Mr. Crow, Minerva desperately wanted to learn this different method of performing her craft. Her ears picked up at an altercation happening outside her class and the professor was moving before she even realized it. Ron was raging, he'd been called an idiot in front of the entire class. If that wasn't bad enough, all he'd managed to do was set his match on fire while Neville produced a needle. Watching the boy who lived working with Neville had his jealously meter off the scale especially after overhearing that Neville would be joining them for potions lessons tomorrow. He just had to say something. Think you're pretty special now, showing the professors how to do magic. Hermione was on Harry's arm and tried to steer him away from another confrontation. Ignore him Harry. I wasn't talking to you bookworm. You knew who he was on the train but kept quiet about it, it's probably your fault he got stuck in Ravenclaw. The boy who lived should be in Greyfinder, everybody knows that. Hermione couldn't believe the nerve of this clown. You were right Harry, he's an idiot. Ron wasn't about to take that from a girl, his wand was out and a curse fired before anyone realized what was going on. Harry jerked Hermione out of the curse's path, but that just saw it hit Pudma. Harry then flew at Ron, slamming him into the wall and snapping his wand before he could fire off another curse. Harry was just about to start pounding on him when McGonagall's voice boomed out along the corridor. Mr. Crow, stop this at once. What do you think you are doing? I think I'm stopping this idiot firing off any more curses in the corridor, please check on Pudma Professor. He cast a curse at Hermione but hit Pudma instead. Harry didn't release his grip on Ron, waiting to hear what the spell was first before deciding if beating him up was worth the detentions that were sure to follow if he did. Pudma had trouble answering the inquiries after her health. Every time she opened her mouth, a large slug would slide over her lips and down her chin. She wasn't in any physical pain but being disgusted and mortified at the same time was certainly painful enough. Miss Granger, could you and her sister help the injured Miss Poddle to the infirmary? Weasley and Crow, my classroom now. The rest of you, get to lunch. Parvati and Hermione helped Pudma off in the direction they'd been pointed while Harry practically threw Ron back into the classroom. The Greyfinder decided that he who got in first would be believed and didn't even wait to be questioned. Professor, he just attacked me for no reason, broke my wand too. I tried to stop him but the curse hit that other girl, that was an accident. Harry sat calmly on the seat the professor had indicated, saying nothing before being asked a question. 
McGonagall duly obliged. Well, Mr. Crow, can I hear your version of events? Weasley here began shouting at us the instant we left the class, as this was what had alerted Minerva that something was going on, Harry was already being believed. He then made some ludicrous accusations against Miss Granger, who responded by pointing out he was an idiot. He took offense to the truth being spoken and fired a curse at her, I only just got Hermione out of its path. I then grabbed the idiot and pushed him against the wall, this must be what broke his wand. I was just about to punch him when you yelled for me to stop, so I reluctantly did. He's lying professor, I. Ron stopped in mid-flow because Harry was now on his feet, it was his hand on the sword hilt that terrified him though. Calling me a liar is not something I will ever accept. Do you want to change your mind or do we need to take this further? Ron then proved he wasn't a complete idiot by changing his story to the truth. I'm sorry professor. It was all my fault. I lost my temper. You also just lost 50 points from Greyfinder and will begin two weeks of detentions tonight, now get out of my sight. Ron shot out of there as McGonagall now turned her attention to Harry. Mr. Crow, while I applaud your actions in defending your friends, I can't condone your conduct in attacking another student. I would have been there within seconds and dealt with the problem. Harry nodded in acknowledgement. Your pardon professor, but my only other experience of Hogwarts discipline didn't fill me with confidence. You are correct though, and I will accept whatever punishment you wish. Minerva almost smiled at that answer. There will be no Ravenclaw points deducted and I was thinking along the lines of a single detention. I will speak to your head of house before confirming this, does that sound fair? Certainly fairer than, 10 points from Slytherin, professor. Good then let us both head for lunch. Minerva found the boy to be polite, courteous, and somewhat skillful at avoiding answering questions. What she did learn was certainly interesting, Harry had been working with tutors for years and his knife was one of a kind. That his knife had been commissioned and presented to him by the director of Gringotts clearly meant a great deal to the young lad. In terms of importance to him, Harry probably placed it above the sword that had never left his hip since the sorting. Their cozy chat ended as they entered the Great Hall. Interrupted would probably have been a better description but both were too focused on the defense professor who just barged past them to worry about semantics. Troll. There's a troll loose in the dungeons, I just thought you should know. Quirrell promptly fainted but Harry was already moving before the professor's body hit the ground. Oh. He didn't care about the mayhem left behind him, there was somewhere he needed to be. Harry shouted at the first portrait. I need the quickest way to the infirmary. Sound travels faster than Harry could run so at every staircase or junction, there would be someone in the nearest portrait to guide the Hogwarts champion to his destination. Harry burst through the infirmary doors and it was testament to his frequent training that he still had the breath to speak clearly. The three girls and the school nurse may have been surprised by his dramatic entrance, his revelations afterwards had them scared. There's a troll loose in the castle, we needed to get to somewhere safe. Poppy Pomfrey stared intently at the lad. Young man, I remember your father when he attended Hogwarts. If this is a prank. Goblins don't do pranks ma'am. There is currently a ten foot high ton of muscle, with spell resistant skin and a brain the size of a peanut, wandering about a school full of kids. We need to get behind a strong door that locks. At that, the doors of the infirmary crashed open once more, this time with considerably greater force than Harry had used. The troll actually took one of the doors right off its hinges as it entered the infirmary. Poppy immediately placed herself between the children and the troll. She was a healer though, not a fighter, and her spells were doing nothing more than enraging the beast further. Ma'am stop, I'll try and lead it back out of here. Harry pushed past her and raced to the side of the beast. Hey pea brain, over here. The smelly troll wielded a club that was as thick around as Harry's waist, and that club was soon whistling in his direction. Harry had expected nothing else and had ducked under the club, his knife cutting a gash in the troll's thigh as he dodged past and behind it. Harry now had the doors at his back and was trying to get the troll to chase him out them, the troll though had four easier targets already in the large room. 
As it once more made its way toward the girls, Harry slashed the back of its leg. Hey Smelly, don't turn your back on me. Didn't you know that was rude? Chase me, come on, try and catch me. The troll took a half-hearted swing at him before once more focusing on the girls. They were now huddled together against the back wall with the healer still standing in front of them, this was a much more attractive target than one who moved and fought back. Harry had one last slash across the base of its back, targeting the gap between its loincloth and vest. The troll let out a roar of anger while preparing to vent its rage on the target in front of it. Harry wasn't about to let that happen, he returned his knife to its wrist sheath and drew Godric's sword. The troll's next sound was a shriek of pain as it toppled to the floor, Harry's sword had sliced through the back of its right knee. It had still kept hold of its club though, and the troll was now within striking distance of its target. Lying on the ground, the enraged troll pulled its arm back to sideswipe the now screaming girls. The sword of Greyfinder in Harry's hands was so much faster, slicing clean through the troll's arm just below the wrist. It had never been Harry's intention to kill the creature, just lead it from here so it could be captured. In this confined corner of the infirmary, and it now being so close to the girls, Harry really didn't have any other option. He jumped on the prostrate troll's back as his sword flashed down and bit deeply into its neck, severing one of the main arteries to its brain as well as its spine. It was a killing blow as the troll's lifeblood spilled out and covered the infirmary floor. Harry now had time to look at the girls, what he saw there froze his insides. The healer was still in front of them, wand ready to defend as best she could. It was the girls though who Harry couldn't take his eyes off. They were all staring at him but it was the emotions displayed on their faces that told the story. Their fear was understandable but the revulsion and even loathing cut Harry as deeply as any blade. Before they got a chance to say anything, Dumbledore... McGonagall and Sprout rushed through the destroyed doors. Harry was wiping his sword on the troll's waistcoat, more to give him something to do until his mind caught up with what had just happened. While the two witches were looking around at the devastation wrought in Poppy's usually immaculate domain, Albus only had eyes for the boy. What have you done Harry? Poppy jumped all over the headmaster. This young man just saved four lives. How the hell did this thing get into the school? and what kept you? Harry turned and gave a deep bow to the healer. Thank you ma'am. May I say your actions here were exemplary, and I would also like to hear an answer to those questions. Pomona was puzzled so asked what may be considered a stupid question. Mr. Crow, why did you immediately rush here? The troll was supposedly in the dungeons. No offense professor, but I wouldn't believe Professor Quirrell if he told me today was Thursday not without checking first anyway. I wanted to make sure my friends were safe. Albus was not for being distracted. Was it necessary to kill the poor creature? I was trying to lead it back out the doors but it had locked on a target and wasn't for being shifted from that course. Hogwarts, your champion needs assistance. All eyes now watched Harry, wondering just what he was up to. They didn't have long to wait as the bloody Baron came up through the floor. How can Hogwarts assist its champion? I need to know how this troll got into the school. Quirrell had observed how the headmaster got the other troll into the school and simply copied the procedure. Harry was glaring at Dumbledore while asking the next question. Where is Quirrell now? The bloody Baron was now joined by the Fet Friar who answered that question. Quirrell is attempting to break into the third floor corridor that is currently out of bounds. It would seem I owe Quirrell an apology. Harry's glare never left Dumbledore. Letting a troll into the castle, then sending the staff in the opposite direction is rather clever. Why did he need a diversion headmaster? Is this something the staff will deal with or must I head up there too? McGonagall grabbed Dumbledore and practically threw him out the infirmary. This is something the staff will deal with Mr. Crow. Sprout quickly followed them out. In the moment of silence that followed their departure, Harry too started to leave the wrecked infirmary. Mr. Crow, where are you going? Harry didn't turn around, nor stop. I am sorely in need of a shower ma'am. He then walked out the infirmary, leaving more than a dead troll behind. Chapter 5 
Cleaning his knife and sword again wasn't strictly necessary, but the repetitive and familiar actions required for this task offered Harry some comfort. At this moment in time, that was as good a reason as any for Harry to be sitting doing nothing but that. After his shower, he didn't really feel like facing anyone else at the moment. He was currently holed up in his room but was surprised when his self-enforced solitude was broken by the Ravenclaw house ghost. The grey lady passed through his closed door to speak with the young Ravenclaw. The quarrel problem has been dealt with by the senior staff. Yeah? Just a pity they weren't in time to deal with the troll problem in the infirmary. You did very well today young champion, your father will be proud of you. This was scant comfort to the hurting young lad. He might be the only one, the headmaster certainly wasn't too happy with me. You should come down to dinner, see your friends. Harry gave that idea a resounding no. I think I'll just stay in my room. My father is coming to Hogwarts tomorrow, I can't wait to see him. Seeing the boy was struggling with the consequences of his actions today, his house ghost made a suggestion. Hogwarts can ensure you're not disturbed, if you wish. He had a faint smile on his face at that suggestion. Yes, I would like that. As the ghost left, a tray of food appeared on the bed beside him. Hogwarts would look after her champion. Oh. The senior staff were all in Dumbledore's office, there was a half-empty bottle of fire whiskey on the headmaster's desk. The bottle would take even more of a hammering before their meeting was finished. Minerva repeated the question that had three heads of house hitting the fiery liquid. How can Voldemort not be dead? Even the death of poor Quirinus didn't finish him off, we all saw that spirit escape. Pomona though was looking at the incident from an entirely different angle. I find it very hard to believe that Albus just happened to mention he was going to be removing the item from the third floor this weekend, and we were all fighting a possessed professor the very next day. Was that why the stone was brought here in the first place, as a trap for the Dark Lord? Phileas didn't like the further implications behind Pomona's conjecture. I have trouble believing it could be mere coincidence that this all happened the year Mr. Crow came to Hogwarts. You could practically see the wheels turning inside the little professor's head as he replayed the other disturbing information that had recently been revealed. The conclusions he was coming to were scaring the head of Ravenclaw he rounded on Dumbledore. You knew Voldemort wasn't gone and decided not to tell anyone, didn't you? I'm willing to bet the goblins discovered this, and that's why you were barred from Gringotts. These assumptions also led Pomona to draw her own terrible conclusions. Child of prophecy, Hogwarts champion, and now slayer of trolls. I'm also willing to bet the prophecy concerns that child and Voldemort, and Albus Dumbledore knows all about it. Minerva had no problem following her two friends' train of thought. She also didn't like where that train was heading, nor was the head of Greyfinder shy about taking her complaints to the conductor. If I discover you were in any way responsible for that troll incident today, I will take my findings straight to the Board of Governors. Children's lives were put at severe risk with that creature loose in the castle. Phileas had more to say. In light of our suspicions, I demand to be at that meeting with Bark Hoke tomorrow. I am Mr. Crow's head of house and intend to see his best interests protected while Harry's at Hogwarts. This was one bandwagon Minerva definitely wanted to join. I demand to be there too. If Voldemort returns and young Harry is involved, it will undoubtedly affect the entire school. You have lost the trust of your heads of house. We no longer believe that you can be relied upon to fulfill your obligations as a headmaster should. Pomona was in wholehearted agreement with those sentiments. This doesn't just affect a specific house, those pupils in the infirmary could have been from any of the four. Poppy is a renowned healer but would be the first to admit she was out of her depth today. Young Mr. Crow literally saved their lives, and all you could do was attempt to reprimand the lad. The head of Hufflepuff's disgust at Dumbledore was there for all to hear, her inbred sense of loyalty well and truly offended. I saw Hogwarts respond instantly to his call for assistance, I feel she will also take action against any attempts made to circumvent her champion. I can't help but think Harry being there today, clearly possessing the appropriate training and tools, has further endeared Hogwarts to her chosen champion. 
you could find yourself out a job headmaster. She gave this a few seconds to sink in before making her own demands. I also intend to be at this meeting, I want to hear what the lad's father has to say about this. Minerva remembered what had taken place during her lesson earlier. There may be more of us looking for a job than you think Pomona. Mr. Crow claimed that transfiguration was the easiest form of magic to master, requiring only one spell, and then proceeded to prove it. He turned a book into a chicken with no recognized wand movement or spell incantation. Snape had been quiet the entire meeting but couldn't hold back at this, his reply was dripping with contempt. You've obviously been pranked, no first year could do that. The book would have been pre-spelled to transfigure on command. The Hogwarts deputy was in no mood to mollycoddle anyone's feelings and ripped right into the potions professor. I am well aware of how that prank works Severus, which is why I gave him a book that belonged to me and determined the item I wanted the lad to transfigure it into. He also further transfigured the chicken into a woven basket and finally a kitten, all by the same method. Albus seized at this opportunity to turn the subject away from his relentless verbal castigation. And just how did Mr. Crow accomplish this feat? Surely not by wandless magic. He used his knife. Minerva had to hold her hand up to prevent the interruptions that she could see coming from Albus and Severus. The lad knew the ministry interpretation of what constituted a wand verbatim. Is there anyone here who doesn't believe Mr. Crow's knife will not break any of the ministry's guidelines of just what they define a wand is? When you take into account that his knife was a personal gift from Ragnok, then you can guarantee it will fall outside ministerial law. Snape couldn't stand the son of his former school day's enemy receiving praise. If he's so bloody good at magic, why did he have to kill a troll with a sword? I would have expected him to tie it up in pink ribbons and bows, just waiting on us coming to collect it. And just how many 11-year-olds do you know who could take down a fully grown mountain troll? Phileas wasn't for letting Snape or Dumbledore off with anything. Can I assume from your attitude that you don't want to be part of this meeting tomorrow? The brat has made it perfectly clear that he wants nothing to do with me, well the feeling is mutual. No, I will not be at that meeting. Excuse me, but the thought of listening to more talk about that boy is making me quite nauseous. I shall retire for the night. As Snape was leaving, Phileas had a parting comment for the potions professor. I think the problem is young Harry made it publicly clear he wanted nothing to do with you, just remember that Severus. Harry has already proven my earlier statement correct, never mess with a goblin. As Snape left, Minerva once more turned the argument back to Dumbledore. So headmaster, are you going to tell us this prophecy, or are we going to have to ask a goblin about it tomorrow? Albus could only stall his senior staff, and hope the goblin would tell them nothing tomorrow. He was beginning to regret arranging that meeting, the timing of it just couldn't be worse. Oh. Harry came down the stairs with the intention of carrying out his normal morning exercise routine, he found an unexpected sight waiting on him. Hermione had fallen asleep on a chair turned to face his staircase, obviously intent on not letting him get past her. It should also have been obvious from her attire what the young witch's intentions were but Harry had never seen clothing like this. The shorts came down to just above her knees and clung to Hermione like a blue and pink second skin. The short sleeved top was of the same colorful design and material, clinging to her every curve while exposing part of her midriff. Chunky footwear completed the ensemble, all made of something called Nike, and she had even attempted to tie her hair back into a ponytail. Hermione's mane could never be tamed by a mere hair tie and was already escaping to cover her face. Harry gently moved the escaped locks away from her eyes, only for those expressive hazel orbs to shoot open. Harry would later swear he didn't see Hermione move but she must have, how else could she now be standing and wrapped all around him? Oh Harry, you've no idea how happy I am to see you're alright. You walked out the infirmary covered in blood and I was sure some of it must be yours. Madame Pomfrey had to practically force feed me a calming draft to stop me chasing after you, she said we were all suffering from shock and kept us in her apartment while the infirmary was being repaired and fumigated. She let us out at dinner time and then I couldn't find you anywhere, no one could. 
Where were you? Harry had thought he had lost his friends but, if the way Hermione was clinging to him was any indication, that was clearly not the case. I was in my room, I thought you wouldn't want to be my friend after what I did yesterday. Hermione took his face in her hands, ensuring he could look into her eyes as she answered that question. What you did yesterday was the bravest thing I've ever seen. We were all terrified yet you took command of the situation. I saw and heard you try to get the troll away from us, it didn't leave you any other option. You looked as if you would never want to see me again, as if I frightened you. You scared the bloody life out of me. I thought that troll was sure to kill you. The smell in the infirmary was atrocious, there was blood splattered everywhere and Padma was actually shooting slugs from her mouth as she screamed, not one of life's better experiences. A shiver ran down Hermione just thinking about it. Harry must have felt it because he held her tighter, giving the young witch the courage to say the next bit I actually couldn't believe we all survived and just stood there in shock, it wasn't until Madame Pomfrey began to treat us I realized you had left. I'm sorry if you thought that Harry, I can assure you nothing could be further from the truth. So Padma and her sister don't hate me. This had Hermione blushing and really piqued Harry's curiosity. He held the silence until she eventually answered his question. The twins seemed to think they now owe you a life debt, Parvati saw both of them marrying you as the perfect way to repay this debt. Harry struggled to hold his laughter as he pushed for more. I saved you as well, what does Hermione Granger think of this idea? Oh, Parvati had thought of that as well. I was to marry you too, and become part of your harem. Harry couldn't hold his laughter any longer much to the consternation of Miss Granger. I hardly see how that is funny Harry. Oh you would, if you knew more about goblins. Harry regained control of his laughter before giving Hermione the information she was missing. Goblins have one mate, and that mate is for life. No goblin would ever take part in a multiple relationship like she's suggesting. I would really appreciate it if my best friend made sure certain others got to hear about that fact. For some reason this put a wide smile on Hermione's face, Harry reckoned that now would be a good time to ask what was on his mind. Hermione, what are you wearing? The pink tinge had once more returned to her features. Oh this is my mother's idea of exercise clothes. I had hoped for jogging bottoms and a hoodie, a track suit even. Mother has to go and buy spandex, so it was this or robes. Shall I go and change? No those are great. They won't restrict your movement in the slightest. What Harry didn't say was holding her dress like that felt really different, but in a good way. This gave Hermione the opening she was looking for. Okay, so we know I'm wearing spandex but I've never seen anything like you've got on. What is it? You never want to see this either. My tunic is made from the hide of a Hebridean black, one of the few species of dragon native to Britain. Hermione was running her hands over his chest without realizing quite what she was doing. This is dragon skin. It feels soft yet tough at the same time. Yes, well, it provides protection, against spells or blades. Harry was almost stuttering before pulling himself together. Do you want to do some training? I think we should just start with a light run this morning. This was quickly agreed upon and they left the common room. Hermione once more on Harry's arm. Oh. Padma found Hermione sitting on the stairs and had to help the clearly exhausted witch reach her room. What happened to you? Oh I went training with Harry. His idea of a light workout was a three mile run, my legs gave out halfway up the stairs. I really need to shower and get ready but I don't think I can. Padma had an idea how to get her friend moving. That's too bad. Parvati will have the story of what happened yesterday all over the castle by now. My sister is quite taken with your best friend, she'll probably be sitting on Harry's lap before breakfast is over. The exhausted witch suddenly found reserves she didn't know she possessed. Hermione didn't see Padma's smile as she hurried past her smirking friend for a quick shower. Oh. Hermione entered the great hall on Harry's arm as usual, but that was where usual ended. Padma hadn't been joking about her twin sister. Harry's exploits from yesterday were now known by everyone, 
which probably explained why everyone was now staring at them. Harry had just sat down between Hermione and Padma when they were approached by the other Poddle sister. Mr. Crow, I would like to formally acknowledge that I owe you a life debt. The rest of the Great Hall didn't even bother pretending that they weren't listening to every word, they easily heard Harry's reply. I'm sorry Miss Poddle, but I can't accept that. Parvati was rocked on her heels at Harry's answer, it was certainly not what she expected. Why not? There's no question that you saved my life. Actually, I rushed to the infirmary to make sure my friends were okay, you just happened to be there too. Goblins always look out for their friends and family, there can be no debts between Hermione, Padma, or I for doing so. It was a downtrodden Parvati that headed back to the Greyfinder table, fighting to hold back the tears. Harry wasn't exactly sure what he'd done and asked Padma if she could explain it to him. You basically told Parvati that if we weren't in the infirmary, you wouldn't have come racing to the rescue. Harry nodded at that. If you and Hermione had been in the hall yesterday, I wouldn't have gone anywhere. I didn't go looking for the troll, I went looking for the both of you. The troll just happened to find us, and Parvati just happened to be there too. I can't accept a life debt for that. I certainly didn't mean to offend your sister though, and I'm still not sure how I did. Hermione attempted to help him understand. Harry, you have no idea just what a heroic figure you appeared yesterday. You were decisive, calm and the way you protected us was terrifying to watch. That troll was enormous yet you felled it like a tree the instant it got too close. Parvati is just upset that you didn't perform your heroics to rescue her. I think I see. Padma, please tell your sister that I may have raced there to ensure you and Hermione were safe but I would have protected anyone from that troll. Well, perhaps I would have let it beat up Malfoy or Weasley for a while before I stopped it. Padma knew it was more a case of her sister had never had to play second fiddle to her before. Hearing that Harry had raced to the infirmary to see that she was safe, after publicly clobbering the Weasley boy for hitting her with a spell in the first place, would be a shock to Parvati's system. When she put it all together like that, it was a shock to Padma's too. Seeing that the morning entertainment appeared to be over, Roger asked Harry a question that everyone wanted to know the answer to. Harry, why did you use Greyfinder's sword on that troll? Oh, my knife wasn't quite big enough to bring it down, pass those sausages over please Hermione. That ended all questions on the subject, no Ravenclaw could fault logic like that. As the noise level in the hall returned to what passed for normal at mealtimes, Harry had a question to ask both his friends. My father is coming to Hogwarts today, would you like to meet him? Hermione and Padma both said yes at once, putting a wide smile on Harry's face. That smile just got wider as Professor Flitwick entered the Great Hall, accompanied by a goblin Harry clearly knew. No one in the hall was quite sure what to make of the boy who lived getting to his feet before respectfully bowing to a goblin. Well met Master Pitslay, it really is a pleasure to see you again. I had no idea who my father had arranged to tutor potions and am delighted you have made the journey here. Well met Harry Crow, yes your father asked me to use that name while you are inside Hogwarts. I was hardly likely to let some wizard ruin all the hard work I had expended on your potions tuition. Master Flitwick has kindly arranged a classroom that should meet our needs, though I understand we have a few more students wishing to learn potions properly. Yes Master Pitslay three of my friends. Will that be acceptable? That will be fine. If they prove adequate, we might add a few more as the week's progress. This proved too much for Snape who stormed out the Great Hall. Hogwarts students being taught potions by a goblin. He would have to take some action about that. Minerva McGonagall felt she needed to take some action too. She approached the group and Phileas introduced her. After the pleasantries, Minerva got right down to business. A trait that would endear her to anyone of goblin decent. Master Pitslay, as deputy headmistress, I would like to observe you teaching our students this morning. Please understand, I mean no slight on your capabilities. Certain others might cast aspersions on you teaching at Hogwarts, I will be able to deal with them in my official capacity if I have witnessed your lesson firsthand. 
The goblin bowed slightly to McGonagall. I look forward to your company professor, and thank you for your honesty and forethought. Neither Hermione, Pudma, or Neville had a problem cutting their breakfast short so Professor Flitwick could lead them all to the classroom set aside for their potions lessons. After watching the way Snape had stormed out of the hall, missing lunch and dinner too would have been a small price to pay. If the longing looks they received from three quarters of the other first years were any indication, they clearly thought so too. Oh. Minerva sat at the back of the class, not sure what to expect. If Harry's transfiguration tuition was any indicator, then she needed to be ready for anything. What she didn't expect was the children being told to put their books away before being handed a different one from their new professor. Pitsley was kind enough to hand her a copy too. Now I feel we must lay a few ground rules down here before we start, give you some idea of what to expect from me as your teacher. First of all, I intend to be finished the first year course before your next holiday. Pitsley let that statement sink in before continuing. I intend to achieve this by not wasting both our times continually brewing different potions just so you learn one specific procedure or technique. When I teach you something, I expect you to remember it first time. Harry had heard all of this before but enjoyed watching his friends nod in agreement with that last statement. Secondly, I won't be issuing what would properly be called homework. I don't care if you can write me a three-foot essay on how you would brew something, I would much rather we spent our time ensuring you can actually brew that specific potion. That, boys and girls, is what I class as homework. Each week I will tell you the potion that you are going to be brewing the next time you see me. Your task then is to research all the steps, procedures, and ingredients to the stage where you can brew it perfectly. The books I've just given you should be extremely helpful with each task. Minerva thought the goblin teacher's expectations were too high, until she opened the book Pitsley had given her. That the potion formula and brewing procedure were clearly laid out was to be expected. What she'd never seen before was the wealth of additional information provided in a reference section that was easily two-thirds of the entire book. Pitsley took them through just what he expected, clearly showing each student how to glean the information on every ingredient and why they must follow the steps exactly. The goblin demonstrated each step of the procedure, actually brewing the potion himself. He encouraged them to ask questions but, instead of answering them, preferred to lead them whenever possible through the book so they could discover the correct answer for themselves. Hermione though had a question that required a direct answer. Sir, why is Harry's book so much thicker than ours? Mr. Crow already has a few years of my tuition under his belt, hence we'll be working on a different potion next week. Pages are added to your books as your skills increase. If things progress as I hope, your books should all be updated before December ends. There is a high probability that our numbers will increase. At that time, you three will be working on whatever potion I have assigned you, while Harry works on another. Any newcomers will of course start at the beginning, it is perfectly normal in a goblin classroom to have students working at different levels. Once you have brewed a few potions, I shall see where we go from there. The lunch bell surprised everyone, including Minerva. She hadn't intended to spend the entire lesson here, only enough time to ensure the students were being taught to the same standard as the rest of their year mates. She found the handout to be one of the best educational textbooks she'd ever seen and the teaching method fascinating. Minerva could see the positive implications of this, Severus was always complaining about expensive ingredients being reduced to sludge or cauldrons melted by dunderheaded students. It would be very interesting to compare the two methods. She really only had one question. Master Pitsley, what do you do when a student arrives at class clearly not having carried out the preparation work you set them? The little goblin seemed affronted at that question. No student of mine would ever dare. Harry quickly covered for McGonagall's unintentional gaffe. Master Pitsley is the foremost potion brewer in goblin society. It is such an honor to be tutored by him that his statement is of course correct. There is no way a student of his would arrive for class unprepared. Their tutoring would come to a swift end, and the disgrace of that would follow them for the rest of their lives. Hermione, 
Fudma, and Neville certainly had no intention of ever arriving unprepared. Not only would that mean letting Harry down, their only other alternative was Snape. They may not have done any brewing here today but all now felt confident they could make the required potion next week. For Neville, that was really saying something. Oh. As they walked back to the Great Hall, McGonagall spotted another goblin standing there waiting with Phileas. The deputy headmistress also spotted something that warmed her heart. Just for a few seconds, Harry had let his mask slip and Minerva was delighted at what she saw displayed there. Here was a young boy, away from home for the first time in his life, laying eyes on a loved parent. Having observed the Disleys all those years ago, she really couldn't imagine Harry ever having the same kind of reaction to seeing his aunt and uncle. This was her first indication that Harry growing up with the goblins was a good solution to that young orphan's problem. Hermione was on Harry's arm and could literally feel the excitement course through him as he spotted the goblin who must be his father. She was practically dragged in that direction. Well met father, how are you today? All the better for seeing you, my son. Bark Hoke was smiling inside at the young girl on his son's arm, though of course none of it showed on his face. Will you introduce me to your friends? This is Hermione Granger, Pudma Podil, and Neville Longbottom. This is my father, senior accounts manager, Bark Hoke. Hermione paid no notice Bark Oak's classic pinstriped suit, that he was slightly shorter than his son or had pointy ears. Harry called him father and that was more than good enough for her. The young Ravenclaw immediately offered her hand in greeting, saying, Pleased to meet you sir. Pudma and Neville took their lead from Hermione and offered the same greeting. Bark Hoak couldn't remember the last time he'd shaken a witch or wizard's hand, his son had chosen his friends well. Master Flitwick has arranged for us to lunch together before our meeting with the headmaster, the meeting will now be joined by some of the senior staff too. Harry was well aware it wasn't considered polite to switch to the goblin language in the company of those who didn't understand it, he was also aware certain situations called for it. He considered this one of those situations. Father, can my friends join us for lunch? I feel they really need to know important information about me. This caught Bark Hoke on the hop, his son hadn't been gone a week yet wanted to tell these friends his secret. He was delighted his son had a best friend, that she was muggle-born was in many ways a bonus. That was a side of the world that he was ill-equipped to teach his son anything about, but this was moving way too fast. Are you sure about this Harry? Once told, you can't take it back. Harry nodded determinately, the girls were almost killed yesterday. I was forced to slay a troll that was trying to bludgeon them to death. Bark Oak's mask slipped at that, he practically growled at Harry's head of house. You shall be explaining that to me later, and why I was not contacted immediately. Hermione had been surprised when Harry started speaking what she could only guess was the goblin language, that was nothing though to watching his father's public face slip for a second. She remembered Harry telling her his father had fought two duels to the death to protect him, she now had no problem believing that. Public face back fully in place, he then switched effortlessly to English. Harry has asked that his friends join us for lunch, I would be delighted with that. I certainly want to know more about his friends, and especially what happened yesterday. The goblin's last phrase was said in a harder tone, and specifically aimed at McGonagall. Minerva quickly responded. Sir, I'll be more than happy to answer any and all questions you may have at the meeting. I'm hoping you may answer some of mine. The concerned father gave a slight nod at that. I hope we can cooperate but please be assured, the safety of my son will always be paramount in any discussions we have. I was not aware that fighting trolls was actually part of the Hogwarts curriculum. If this is the best your school has to offer, it will be a short meeting and my son will be returning home with me. Harry felt Hermione's fingers dig into his arm at that, he placed his hand over hers to offer some reassurance. He was pretty sure his father was bluffing, he was also pretty sure he was the only one there who thought so. Harry was certain his father's words would get back to the headmaster before the meeting, which was his father's entire reason for speaking them here. They were led into a room set up for lunch and Harry invited Master Flitwick to join them, 
alerting his father that their head of house should be considered an ally in what was to come. Barkhoke responded in kind by offering some comfort to the young girl who was clearly building herself up into a state of distress. Please don't trouble yourself Miss Granger. Should Harry leave Hogwarts, arrangement would be made to ensure he stayed in contact with his best friend. Oh thank you sir, but Harry already knows my feelings. Hermione, before you say any more, there is something I need to tell you. I need to tell all of you. Harry had just sat at the table with Hermione and Padma either side of him, his father now sat opposite and nodded his acceptance of the situation. What I'm about to say may make a difference to where we go from here. You all heard the Sorting Hat call me prophesied one, well the prophecy in question concerns me and Voldemort. He's not dead, and will be coming after me. It was Flitwick who broke the silence that followed Harry's revelation. Having just had the worst fears of the senior staff confirmed, it was time to declare whose side he was on. This is not for repeating outside this room, Voldemort was in the castle yesterday. He possessed Professor Quirrell and let the troll into the castle. Harry shared a glance with his father before continuing. We didn't think he would be able to stage a return for a few years yet, this is why I just had to tell you. Being around me could be dangerous. Harry found himself confronted by a witch determined to get her point across. Hermione was so determined, she was sitting on his lap with her face mere inches from his. You listen to me Crow, it's taken me nearly twelve years to find a best friend. If you think for one second that I'm going to give that up then the hat was wrong to put you in Ravenclaw. Barkhoke now thought his son had made the right decision as he watched Harry's arms snake around the young witch. It was heartwarming to watch as these two drew comfort from each other while the rest of his friends quickly supported him. Pudma was in Ravenclaw for all the right reasons, and used that claw reasoning to convey to Harry she wasn't going anywhere. You say I may be in danger if I stay your friend, I say I would be dead if I wasn't. You said it yourself Harry, you only raced to the infirmary because your friends were there. We all know the professors would have gotten to the infirmary too late to do anything but clean up the mess. I'll take the danger because I think I'm far safer, and certainly happier as your friend. Neville was blushing but determined to prove the same hat had put him in Greyfinder for a reason. My reason is more like Hermione's, though without the hugs. It's taken me a long time to make any friends, and that's a lot to give up. Besides, you told me we're practically family. I wouldn't be much of a family if I ran away now. Hermione had such a tight hold of Harry she could feel the tension leave his body as they all declared they were going nowhere. She sat back, still on his knee, to ask the next question. Okay, that explains all the training and tutors. Now, have you anything else to let slip or can we eat our lunch? I never knew running in the morning could give you such an appetite and we cut breakfast short. As Miss Granger slipped into her own seat and began eating her lunch, Barkhoke lost it. Both Harry's letters home had been full of this young witch, and he had a good idea of just how apprehensive his son was about telling her the prophecy. Seeing her reaction to the news caused Barkhoke to burst out laughing. Son, I heartily approve of your friends. Miss Granger, no matter what happens here today, you can rest assured you will be in Harry's life as long as you both want that to be so. The relief amongst the young people was palpable, now all Barkhoke needed was the meeting with the headmaster to go as well. First though, he wanted to hear how his son had taken out a troll. 